can get it started. Bing. Yeah. Are your arms that long? <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to let you guys do that one. Hey, uh, we'll have to do it in the air, buddy. <laughs> there yeah, we go. That's all I can do. You saw that workout I had to get in here into this space a minute ago, right? Yeah. Where I had to kick my leg over and all that. I just want to put that live on air that I was able to do that. Yeah, that's good. Very flexible. <laughs> Extremely. It's that's deceptively flexible. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> Dusty, why don't you uh, just... Tell everyone who you are and introduce yourself. All right, cool. Um, my name's Dusty, uh, which, whichever camera I'm looking into. I'm Dusty, this is your and then I, I'd say another name into this camera and another name into that camera. Right? <laughs> That's the way you should do it. That's right. Um, I do stand-up comedy and improv uh, comedy. Um, been doing it for coming up this, I think, next month on six years. And I'm uh, one of the co-owners of a little company called Attention Horse for Nerds, uh, Attention Horse Comedy for Nerds. And it's, uh, it's what you think it is. It's comedy for nerds. It's what we do. <laughs> nerdy, nerdy shit, like movies, comics, cartoons, all that stuff. Yeah, you actually just did a, uh, a show at uh, one of my businesses, a uh, business I co-own, a comic book, comic book store in Greensboro, yeah. Yeah, the Comic Dimension had a phenomenal time, and if things go right, should be able to do a, a roast coming up. We do a lot of character roasts as well, along with all kinds of shows. Uh, we we got about thirty or thirty-five in the bucket, you know. Awesome, man. Um, cool. From trivia to whatever. So. Awesome. So, uh, what did you do before comedy? Um, I, 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 I did marriage. I was married for a oh, while. Yeah. <laughs> it was a full-time <laughs> job, guys. It's crazy. <laughs> Uh, I hated it. The pay was bad. Uh, you never got paid back as much. And I think when I left, uh, within a month uh, or two months, I, had, I started doing comedy. And it, here we are. Yeah. You got to find something to uh, laugh about after that. Right. Yeah, definitely. Or yell about it. You know, you can't yeah. call them up and yell about how mad you are. Right. They never laugh back like they should because you, know <laughs> you know you're telling the truth. Uh, that's hilarious. What, uh, when did you decide to go into comedy? Um, I think it was something that started when I was a kid. Like, when I was a kid, I, I would watch uh, sitcoms, television, movies, and some of my biggest influences are people like uh, Jaleel White, who played uh, Urkel, you know, on oh, yeah. uh, Family oh, yeah. Matters. There was something about the way he was that just made me laugh and I wanted to be that guy. So I, a lot of mimicking, I think I started off as mimic. Um, I would say what I saw, like a parrot, and I guess that helped with impressions type of a thing. Yeah. Cause you don't, you can't do impressions until you start doing impressions and you want to be that person. And I would go to school and I'd do that and I'd get in a shit ton of trouble <laughs> all the time because <laughs> yeah, I'd get things on my progress report. Like, oh, he's a class clown. I mean, yeah, I guess you're right. I do have a personality. I'm sorry. You know, so I got in a lot of trouble for shit like that. And it was something like that. And I kind of lost focus of that growing up um, life, you know, yeah, you think yeah. about things. And it, I remember telling my ex-wife, I, I was like, I want to do stand up comedy. She's like, well, they'll just laugh at you. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> that's the point. I was like, God, that's why I hate you. That's why this is over. That's when I left right there. I was like, I faked all my orgasms. I'm done. We're out of here. <laughs> Said goodbye to the stepkids because you can do that if you're a step parent. You don't have to take them with you. You just say goodbye. Uh, and started doing it and realized that it was so much harder <laughs> than I thought it was going to be. Oh, yeah. That's funny. Did you ever hit a point? So you said you, you know, Steve Urkel inspired and, and people like that. Did you ever hit a point in school where people kind of put you in a box and try to discourage you from doing that or that behavior, including your, your ex-wife? But when did that happen to where you tried to join the real world? I, I wouldn't say I tried to join the real world as much as just kind of, I think, uh, the search for things through drugs and stuff like that diminishes some of the light that right. you're born with, if that makes sense. Sometimes it enhances it if you use it the right way. Right. But I think when you're searching for something and you try to fill a void because there's something you're looking for that's not there, I think you can do drugs so much that it numbs what you had. And sometimes it's so bad that you'll never get it back. Right. Well, yeah. <clears throat> sort of like an escape, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, who, who doesn't like to feel better for a little while? You know, and yeah. the problem is the more you do it, it, it's like it's not as 
fun as it was when I started. Right. It's a tough world. Yeah, it's a diminishing return. So every time you do something, the first time you do it, you get an effect, and the second time, slightly less. And, yeah. and, it, and it just continues to be that way. So you got to do more of whatever it is that's, uh, that's fulfilling you. Mm-hmm. And eventually you're not getting that same feeling. So Right. Yeah. yeah. Kind of a thing. And I mean, like some things I think are safe all the, all the time. Yeah. You know? I, agree. Reefer, I don't think reefer's ever that bad. I think if you have anxiety when you do it, choose when you do it. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, drinking, you know, you could do it whenever you want. Don't do it too much. Don't drive because a guy named Officer Allred will find you and arrest you <laughs> twice. <laughs> like the same motherfucker is the same guy. I was like, are we are we meant to be together, Officer Allred? <laughs> Let's just do it now, bro. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's funny. Uh, <laughs> what are the odds? Right. Shout out to Officer Allred. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he's listening. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, great sense of humor. <laughs> So funny story. I actually met Dusty years ago at a Bible study mm-hmm. when he was a kid. How old were you back then? I, if I'm thinking correctly, I had to be maybe middle of high school. So maybe 15, 16. Yeah, 16, like 17, that. maybe. What what church? It was just at a friend's house. Oh, okay. we were doing a um, like a group study. Ah, uh-huh. I'm not religious anymore, but yeah, uh, I have my beliefs, but it's not you know organized religion is not my thing, but. Um, it's just kind of funny that I started doing open mics and then Dusty came up to me. He's like, Hey man, did you used to do a Bible study? Yeah. And I was like, what are the odds? Oh yeah. <laughs> I remember you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. But I, uh, it was so weird. What, what I remembered most about meeting you, um, uh, was your shirt. The first thing, this one right here, you're wearing. Oh midnight. yeah. 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 And that's right. Yeah. I think that's a very specific type of music that, not just every day I run into a shirt like that. So yeah, when yeah. I see that, I'm like, I've got to say something to this gigantic individual named Neil right here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this Lord of the land. And uh, I, I think I had added you on Facebook and I saw some of your friends. I was like, holy shit, this guy knows dude. I was like, holy crap, we went to that thing. Yeah. I was like, yeah. What a small world. It is. Mm-hmm. And not taking away from organized religions or anything. I respect everybody's oh, beliefs. Shoot. Yeah, no, not like at that. all, man. Do your thing. Mm-hmm. But, uh, those were good times. But. Yeah, well, you know, and you said uh, this beast of a man. You know, what's funny is he's still rather large. But when I, when I first met him, he's a, a fraction of what he used to be. Like, he was just massive. I remember this one. No homo. Got to say that first. <laughs> this one time he was running with his shirt off. <clears throat> he went out to take out the trash, I believe. And you, had to, you have to take your shirt off to do that. It's a rule. Especially if you had a six pack. Exactly. So, <laughs> so the trash was a, a considerable ways away. So he decided he was going to run back after taking the trash out, right? And he's running with his shirt off, right? And I'll, I just see like this mountain of muscle coming at me, and I'm like, "Damn it, I got to work out." <laughs> now, now the six packs in the fridge. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Yes, homo, I wish I was there to see all Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, unfortunately, and I have to ask my wife after this, I'm pretty sure my wife, at the time was my girlfriend, was there to see it, thankfully, right? <laughs> so, you knew she's the one when she stayed with you throughout that's right. the whole thing. She did start run after him. That's right, yeah. That's I think she thought about it. It was fleeting thought, I think, but... Those were good days, too, man. Oh, we had a lot of fun. I yeah, told her I convinced times. her that uh, muscle just was not comfortable. Yeah. And um, this was built for comfort. Oh, exactly. And she bought it. Hey, <laughs> it's true. But yeah, we had some good times back then. Yeah, now I'm more worried about longevity, just staying healthy and living yeah. longer. Yeah. Plus, when I got into acting, they wanted me to lose a bunch of weight too. So. Really? Yeah. Now I just try to stay fit. No joke. Yeah. A- athletic. Dwayne Johnson doesn't like competition. He's mm-hmm. got that space on lock. They're like Neil, you need to lose 30 pounds. You can't compete with Dwayne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just watched the new Jumanji, and I, I was thinking, I was like, he kind of looks like Neil, just not as in good a shape. Yeah, sure. <laughs> not, not hardly. It's Neil. actually a good movie. I'm, I'm kind of like a uh, like a real nice sports car with a fucked up motor. <laughs> it's, about, it's got a prosthetic leg. My back's messed up. Yeah, but you couldn't tell. Like you, if you told me that your foot wasn't, that your leg wasn't real. I'd be like, you're full of shit, Neil. Good science. Yes. That looks like a Very real leg science. through those jeans. I, and I, I can see a real... I can, it's real. It's not know. biological. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a mythical, you know? It's not imaginary. It's imaginary. Yeah, you got the phantom leg that's actually yeah. there. Listen, we were at the bank opening up a new business account, and, and the guy's like, uh, and Neil's more capable than anybody I know. The guy was like, oh, is it? Neil's like, can I use the bathroom? And the guy's like, um, 
well, it's upstairs. Can you do that? And I'm like, <laughs> and Neil's like, oh, yeah, man, I, I can do anything you can do. I'm like, man, this guy can do him do anything we can do. He can do it better than you can do it. Like, this guy's good. Like, we're, we're <laughs> golden. But he's, he's had it so long, I forget he has it. Until other people, like, until you just said something, yep. <laughs> I forget it that he has it. So, well, I know you do a bit about um, about your leg. I was like, you have got to wear shorts or no pants at all. They don't so believe people, you. Yeah, I was going to say, because yeah. if I didn't know who you were, I'd be like, he's lying. I pull yeah. up my pant leg when I do that bit, though, so people can actually believe yeah. me. Well, I want you to rip your pant off. Yeah. That way. That's they, what they, he needs yeah. to do. Yeah. Breakaway. The yeah, breakaways, <laughs> man. <laughs> just break it away. <laughs> yes. Uh. <laughs> that's what he needs to do because they don't they don't believe when they see it they're like wait a second mm -hmm. I just stayed in a hotel in New York I had a back procedure uh, for the second time I had stem cell treatment done on my back for um, degenerative discs yeah, which helped a lot last time so hopefully this time it'll be normal um, but the hotel I stayed in they said it was three and a half stars but mm. there's no way I'm actually writing a bit about that. Oh yeah, that bad, huh? <laughs> it was, yeah, it may have been three and a half stars when it first came, when it was first built a hundred years ago, right. just because it had electricity. Uh. Was it a La Quinta? Was it one of those <laughs> <laughs> Red Roof Inn? Maybe. Yeah, it's it was uh, it's probably it probably still has the same name it had a hundred years ago. Oh uh, okay. But it was close to where they did the procedure. But um, I did feel handicapped there uh. because it was it was built before they gave a shit about handicapped people. <laughs> Oh, so like, this is gonna be fun. Now, surely the the, the place that did the procedure they didn't recommend that place, did they? No, no, it was just close. Ah. It was in, you know it was like a block away, so I was like, this would be perfect. Mm. And I was by myself, so you know it was good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, back to Dusty. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you got going on currently? I know you said you did um, uh, the Comic Dimension recently. Mm -hmm. You got anything up and coming that if people want to come check out uh, that's coming up? I know with the uh, the whole coronavirus well, thing going on right a, now. Yeah, it's a funny question you ask. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I had some shows uh, and some uh, cons coming up. We we were going to do Oak City Con. We were going to do one or two shows there, and it had to be pushed back. So hopefully that'll be be around May. I don't have the specific date in my head right now. Right. But I believe it may have been May 10th that they moved it. Um, that's where we do a lot of our work in our cons. And luckily enough, uh, some locals, uh, you know, you know, after meeting uh, Neil, got the common dimension that we are so lucky to be able to work and do and be around like-minded people. Because you can have that show anywhere. But the problem is, is trying to get like-minded people to show up for that specific show yeah. right it is so much better when people know the universe <laughs> that you're talking about right yeah so if you don't know comic books or something like that and we're doing a roast of batman or shazam or thanos you might not like it right um but really at that show <clears throat> all the people that showed up they weren't our customers though we had we had 30 customers or 30 audience members show up to that show and maybe five of them were actually our customers Wow. The rest were just from the online promotion. No you think you think with it being the comic dimension though that maybe it created a target market like maybe people maybe that they had some, thought it was a comedy club. Yeah, so, some. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I didn't even think. Oh, about I that. didn't. That is yeah, the play on words. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, everybody there had a good time. It was um, a good show, and, and my my bit or my set that I use really is not. Um, I mean, I have one Star Wars joke, but that's other than that, it's it's not geek. No, material. I don't. Yeah, it's, it's I don't just think you're yeah. real world material. And it's the same here. I, I think my set changes depending on where I am. Right. I think it's easier to get away with uh, joking about Dragon Ball Z when I'm at a Comic Con yeah. or something like that compared to, you know, down the road. Because some people weren't cool growing up and didn't watch Dragon Ball Z. And right. Yeah. Their <laughs> life like is sad. <laughs> and what What are your, some of your favorite? Uh, uh, cons like do you like the local cons that are like always going on in uh, Charlotte and that kind of area or do you like going to some of the the bigger more uh, national ones uh, I'll say one of the one of my favorite local cons we've ever done was uh, triad con which is normally here in Greensboro I think close over there by the Marriott Four Seasons Mall such a good place that was actually my my very first con um, okay. it, it all started, it was the day after I got arrested. Uh, I had just gotten arrested <laughs> and probably tops like 12 hours out of, you know, getting out. And I knew I had this show. Uh, luckily enough, uh, Eric Trundy knew I was into like, you know, nerdy stuff and a great comic, by the way, Eric Trundy. And he suggested oh, yeah. me for the show. So I did it. And 
just had a great fucking time. It was the most fun I'd ever had at a show. It was phenomenal. Everything I was into, they were into. And I saw the person that was running it, and I was like, and I saw him do his set, and no offense to that individual, he wasn't funny. The dude was not funny at, at all. And I, and I mean that, because in my head, I knew that this guy was a national, like, touring type of comic who did Dragon Con, which is like the mother with all, like, on this side of the country type right. of con. And he wasn't funny. So I was like, I, I think I can do this. And that's what got the balls rolling. Right. And my friend Reed Pegram, one of the funniest people I've yeah. ever met, recently married. I love you, Reed, wherever you are. And <laughs> I really do. I, I love him with all my heart. And he's a, you know been my business partner for years. And we got the ball rolling. And that next year, we had that show. Nice. And that's, uh, wow, that always means a lot to me. Right. And we've done small ones. We've done one one time. It was in, the, it was in Cape Fear, right? Uh, <laughs> they had us in a, it looked like a closet room, almost like for AA. And there were children walking around. Like, oh. children were with us while we were doing our set. And oh. I, I don't know anybody else's kids, so I can't push them. I can't move them out of the way. I was just like, you little shit, Anthony, get out of here. You know, there's no reason to have you up here. So we've done those, and then we've done uh, one of our favorites is uh, GalaxyCon. Uh, it used to be called SuperCon, but it's GalaxyCon now, and they're gigantic. That that's what you're talking about, like the bigger yeah. ones. I like those as far as um, the weekend. Like I have a whole right. weekend to enjoy. I got wrestling, you know. I got trivia. I got all these different people I can meet. I. One time I came really close to Arn Anderson and I almost cried. Like I was like, oh my God. I was like, I don't want to say anything to you because I think you're mean, but you're some, you're one of the best wrestlers awesome. of all time, you know? Um, so I, I do like the big ones and I do like the small ones. Uh, it just depends on how well they have it set up. Right. Yeah. It's all about setup. I, I think if you set up a, an event the wrong way, it ain't worth the shit. But if you set up a small event really right, that shit's phenomenal. It's magic. Totally. Yeah. Well, that show that uh, you did at the comic book, comic book store was my first show that, that I did. So thank you. No, for thank you, that bro. I wouldn't and, imagine uh, you not being on it. And it went really well. It was, it was a lot oh, of fun. Oh, you did great. And uh, the show was great. And and it was you know it was a pretty small show, but it was a lot of fun. And uh, and uh, you actually you perform at a lot of clubs too, right? Mm. Like clubs? I mean, I don't know. Like. I think when we're talking about our local scene, it, the way is like clubs go, you got my, obviously my home, my favorite, uh, the Itty Box, yep, and sure. then Good Nights. I, I don't get to go there as much as I'd like to. It is a nice drive for me, but that's a, just such a wonderful place for comedy and the comics there, like, and, you know, just phenomenal. How's that in Raleigh? Yes. Okay. And then we recently got the, the Raleigh Improv. I have not been able to perform there yet, but that's, you know, another the other big club around here as well. And then you got the Comedy Zone, which is completely different town to town. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Greensboro, I think, if you're local, good luck. It's more of a national headliner club. Yes. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Charlotte's more of a local scene. There Actually, you go. I was going to yeah. say, yeah. Charlotte does yeah. really well with so, the locals. So and, Paul... Uh, I was going to say Paul owns uh, Paul Talley owns Comedy Zone locally, and I've known him. we've done business with him before and been partner with him. But I've heard that that he doesn't do a whole lot of things with locals. Like uh, you know, after the show, what's it called? You were saying that after the show they'll do the. Uh, a lot of times the bigger clubs like that do open mics after the shows and stuff, but they don't there. Yeah, Comedy Zone he doesn't do that yeah. here. So I, I don't know. I'm sure that, that there's a reason he doesn't. But yeah, I've noticed, and I keep hearing from other people that he's not very local comic friendly. Well, he's not a comedian though. He's just a business guy. True. Makes sense, you know. I mean, I get and, and really, uh, real quick, a big shout out to the Idiot Box too because they're awesome. Oh, it's man, great, phenomenal! Uh, definitely great club here. Like, like I say, when I, you know, earlier talk about when I started, I was calling around to try to figure out where, where can I start doing this, you know? And I, I tried one place. I don't even remember their name. They're probably closed. I hope they are. And they, <laughs> like, well, you need 15 minutes to get up here. I'm like, 15 minutes. I was like, oh my god. Even then, I was like, I don't have 15 minutes yeah, that's anything. That's a professional set. <laughs> yeah. And the next place I called was the Idiot Box, and somebody answered. Pretty sure it was Eric, and we were talking back and forth about what I need. I showed up. First time I'd ever seen live comedy. Got up, did it. It went great for, in my head. Like, I was like, oh, this went great. And then you come back the second time, you're like, oh, I suck. You know, this is horrible. 
but that is the most uh, wonderful place. Like, it right, really yeah. gave me purpose when I was <clears throat> extremely lost at that time in my life. And I, I, I owe everything uh, to yeah. the idiot box. So anybody, anybody out there, when everything cools over, get to the idiot box, all right? If yeah. you're not, you're an asshole. For local comics, <laughs> they really, really care. Yeah. Oh, precisely. Yep. Uh, we, we have a... You... When I first started, people, I think it was almost like a hierarchy in a way, like if somebody was better than you, I, I kept my mouth shut for six months. I didn't say a damn word outside of comedy. Right. Like, I, I stayed around them, went to eat afterwards, and then finally somebody's like, oh, what do you think, Dusty? I'm like, oh, my God. I get to, <laughs> I get to talk. Like, it was like middle school. Yeah. yeah. You know, high uppers, lower uppers type of thing. And I remember it being so hard, and that's why I think it's important to be welcoming to new yeah. people trying stuff because it's hard. Yeah. Did you have a lot of the hard time like when you were first starting out? Did you have like support from like your family and friends when Def you were definitely first not wanting to be a <laughs> definitely not the ex wife. <laughs> yeah. uh, my friends showed up the first time uh, that I did it because a I didn't have uh, GPS and back the, you know six years ago I think you just had the GPS where you like put it on your you know your your front windshield type of thing. Yeah, I didn't have any of that. I didn't know where to go. Uh, before comedy, I was really small town. I had only been where I live, pretty much, uh, which is Denton, and that's no one knows where that's at. Yeah, yeah that's what I was gonna say. Like most, <laughs> yeah, it's a hor it's not a horrible place, but it's a place that's that nice I don't enjoy place, being yeah. around. And the outlet that I require is not there. Yeah, and uh, I think their population is like 400 people, maybe. Yeah, very small. Yeah. Lots of meth. Great meth, by the way. Yeah. If you guys, if you guys hadn't tried meth. Go to Denton. All right, we got the Beth. We got the Beth meth. Beth meth. I was actually going to say, I, I think it was like a horror story when I was growing up. Like, oh, it's in Denton. And you're like, oh, shit. Oh, I don't think we're going to go there, man. Don't want to go there. Yeah. The party's in Denton tonight. No, nah, man. I think, actually, I think I need to get home. I'm grounded, I think. Yeah. Death by bonfire. Yeah, yeah. We, I did go to a bonfire in Denton one time. Uh, I've been to a couple there, yeah. too, as well. Long yeah. time ago, but I will not go back. But, uh, it's one of those memories I forget on purpose. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean, type of thing. It wasn't horrible, but um, yeah, it, it was. As far as family goes, I think at first, like, oh, that's cute, that's great. You're going to do that. Good for you. And you keep doing. It, they're like, oh, you're really doing this. You're still not going to finish college. Okay, gotcha. You know? <laughs> Com it may have been community college, but half of the name is college. All right, so I'll take it. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, it. I, after I realized the second time that, A, I suck, I'm not funny, I don't know how to write, I don't know structure, I don't know shit, my, even the uh, type of charisma I was trying to give off, you know? Yeah. That's that's half the part. you got to learn who you are on to be on stage to talk to people. Right, yeah. Yeah, I've been acting and writing for seven years now, and uh, I started doing the open mics, I guess it was, what, five months ago, maybe five, six months ago? Mm-hmm just as a uh, writing exercise to improve my comedic writing. And um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, I'd done a couple of open mics before, but not, I wasn't pursuing comedy. Right. And uh, <clears throat> after going, to, I went to the idiot box the first time, there was like 30 comics there. And I was like, wow, okay, this is kind of cool. And I mean, I completely ate shit the whole time I was on stage, but, and I've done that many times. It's normal. But, it's uh, completely normal. But it's, it's um, it's a lot of fun. It's a challenge. I, I'm definitely not a comedian. I'm still considered an, maybe an open micer. Uh, but I, I want to keep doing it. And um, Dusty was one of the first guys there to talk. Well, you, you kind of knew me from before, but you, you actually came up and talked to me because, you know, you walk into that kind of environment <clears throat> and you don't know anyone. You completely feel out of place. Yeah. Um, you know, you talk about your, finding your voice, uh, which I, I pretty much know what I like to write. Right. Now it's, I'm learning how to write it as comedy, and, and it's, it's coming together. It's starting to, to work. That's what it's all about. Um, like you said, your five months. Uh, I remember it took me forever just to try to get my first five minutes because you're just constantly just you're throwing shit out there, and you right. don't know what you're doing. Things didn't really work out or help me the most till I took a class. I took a class, and uh, I had Steve Lesser, one of the owners, and yeah. uh, Eric Trundy as my teachers. And both are so good. Like one is very, very like uh, Steve is so like he's smart. You know, Steve's really smart, and so is yeah. Eric. So I don't even. Both but he, guys, yeah. He's super smart. So a lot of his stuff is, is very like, you know, something. It, it makes perfect sense. You right. Know? And yep. then Eric's as well. So both of those together was perfect. By the time I got done with that, that's when I finally started getting my foot in 
to learn right yeah how, how to create a joke or like i know your stuff's funny man you're you're really funny ah oh, thanks man yeah. that re really means a lot um uh, because I wasn't back then. Like, it, I mean, I just, I was an angry dude for a long time, I, it, you know, which is fine. I think you should project who you are while you're up there. Right. Yeah. But I'm much more lighthearted and chill now. Uh, and by lighthearted, I mean like goofy. Uh, some may say stupid, but I think stupid's funny. Yeah. So, but you're, you're obviously very intelligent to come up with the stuff you come up with. And you're quick, too. Like, some of your improv stuff is insane well let's have once again having yeah. good teachers i think having good people yeah. i remember i'd had a i was up about five o'clock in the morning drinking i was just fucked the shit up real bad and the next day was improv <laughs> class like uh uh what, what do you call it were you uh the words audition all right i was going to audition <laughs> <laughs> yes and and um it was uh Eric had told me to do it. I was like, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I showed up, and it's the, one of the smartest decisions I ever made. That's cool. Yeah. I think that's important. You show it no matter what. Because, you know, when you're younger and you're, you're first taking on something, it can be overwhelming. And like you said, you were up all night, you were drinking, whatever that thing is. But that's the difference in people that are successful and not successful is you still got up, you still went, you still showed up, and you tried no matter what. Even, that, even though you had every reason, you could have been like, fuck it, I'm tired, I'm going to sleep. Right. I'm not going. Yeah. You know? And then having the right people say the right thing at the right time makes such an important thing. Like, it, if you want to learn how to do something, I, th I think half the time is asking people that you respect doing that for information. I agree. There oh, are yeah. so many people that have an answer. Oh, yeah. But you, you ask the people that you think, you know, that admire you, you know, you admire them the most. Right, yeah. Ask them. Yeah. That's how you figure shit out. Yeah, go to the people that know. Yeah. yeah. Go to the people that have done it, done what you hope to do. Right. Agreed. Yeah. Everybody else's opinion, uh, man, that's one of the best things I ever had happen was figuring out that these are people that, and people you love typically, they give you terrible advice. Terrible advice. It's not that they're bad people, but they don't know anything about what you're trying to accomplish. So, like you said, you find somebody you admire, somebody you look up to, somebody's done what you want to do. It's the best place to get the advice. It's probably the only place to get the advice. Yeah. And surround yourself uh, yeah. with that thing. When uh, when I got into, like I said, I got on the improv team at the Idiot Box. We have a phenomenal Idiot Box team. Um, I just really respect everybody that's on it. And I've always looked up to everybody that, that was on there because they were so much better. And even, even now, I look at them like they're so much better than me. Uh, it, it's never like a higher than thou type of thing. It's like, you know, student learning from the master. Right, and right. then I got a job being a bartender there, so I could be there for the mic. I was there for both Friday shows. And just being a bartender who could do a little bit of comedy, I was able to do some of these Friday shows that I wouldn't have got otherwise. So, I, I mean, one, like I said, my whole world was just being around this thing that I admired and wanted to do the most. And how long right. have you been doing comedy now? Six, uh, coming up on six years in, okay. in, in April. If I if I go through my my mind right, you know, yeah, I yeah. got divorced, and I think <laughs> it was in February. That you got divorced? Yeah. Yeah. And by divorced, I mean I just said goodbye. I, I don't. I'm still not divorced. Ain't that crazy? Like that I is. didn't I didn't know that. <laughs> what year was that? I know that was uh, to then. Whenever. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I found out I'm still married. Turns out it's not as easy as just saying I break up. You know, like yeah, I thought yeah. it was that easy. But should be pretty easy now though. Yeah. If you want to go ahead. Knock that yeah, well, unless, <laughs> as long as you haven't had any conjugal visits lately. Nope. No. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. It's been as it's been six years and three months. However, like, but once I was said goodbye, I think two, three months later, that's when I tried it out, and I I never stopped. I started out once a week, and then I realized I was like, that's not enough. So I did twice a week, and then three times a week, and then four and five. You know what I mean? Like yep. it keeps going. If you're lucky, you got six nights a week of comedy. And you're tired of shit. I try not to work on Mondays, and I don't like to work on Sundays. So I got five days I like to work. It's good. Do you like being uh, very well rehearsed with the <laughs> material? Or do you prefer the improv kind of style? In my in my heart, I prefer the the improv style because the worry of trying to be scripted is so scary. That's why I did improv because I, I'm very OCD. So I would go over the same shit in my head like a billion times, 100%. So I would do my, on the as soon as I left the house, I would start going over my set, right? And I'd record it, I'd listen to it, wouldn't be perfect, I'd go over it, do it, wouldn't be perfect. That shit was driving me fucking nuts. 
So then once I did improv, it kind of gave me a little leeway, leeway to be relaxed, a little relaxed. So now I try to be in between, but my worst uh, thing about comedy is my memory. If I, I've got plenty of bits that I've written over the past, like I said, about six years, that I can fill plenty of time that I need to do on any show that normally I'm asked to do. Right. But the memory of trying to remember the specific bits just drives me nuts. But you still write a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I write a good bit, and that's like I said, you, I'm sure you know this as well as I do. It's it's hard to create and then sharpen the old. Yeah. But, because I've got bits that I can pull out of my pocket that, on average, should work pretty good, um, and I can still sharpen those, t- you know, those bits up. But the the need to create like that next bit, you know, it's almost like right. a drug. It's like getting that next high. Where it's like, holy shit, this is the, you know, this is my big next two minute bit. Two minutes is a nice set for a bit, you know, and I, I can play with that and stuff and trying to <laughs> sharpen that while sharpen the old. Right. It's such a tough uh, juggling act. <clears throat> yeah. Does most of your bits and stuff center around like comics and like uh, entertainment and fantasy or, or where do you is that like the main source of your your stuff or, or, or w- w- what do you dive into yeah I think you I think you hit the word right I like fantasy uh, the word fantasy so sometimes it does have to do uh, a lot of my riffing bits where like I come up and I'm just fucking around a lot of that has to do like with things I can pull from and play with like uh, movies a lot of times if there's a host I, I like to joke around like oh yeah I remember the first time I met Neil, you know, he he was a <laughs> he was a killer whale. I was a little homeless boy stepping on cakes and shit, you know. And it becomes <laughs> like a free willy bit, right? Out of nowhere, type of yeah. a thing. Um, but yeah, I like to be goofy. I I, I like uh, the if I had to describe, and that's the hardest part about this is trying to talk about yourself. It is so I'm not a narcissistic person at all even though I do stand up, right. which is very narcissistic. <laughs> but it's the only way I know how to like express yourself, yeah, express right. myself, uh, you know, right. um, and trying to talk about yourself. But I, I like to be goofy. I feel um, I like lighthearted shit. I, I've learned over the years, like I used to be an angry comic. I, I remember like we were talking about divorce and just I was so angry. I was so mad, bro. I was just a mad, angry, bald man. And it, it, after a while, I realized, I was like, I wouldn't want to watch that. A guy being mad for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Fuck that shit. So then it just, I don't know. I, I let love work through my life. And it, it, it brought out like a more pure type of comedy. Yeah. Type well, of you've thing. been through a lot too, man. Uh, do you mind talking about a little bit uh, of what you all. went through when you were younger? You had some pretty crazy experiences. Yeah. Over the years, I've had some crazy experiences. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a, like I said, I'm very OCD. Um, and when you have, when you grow up religious and I, in a good religious, I don't mean it in a bad way. I, right. I grew up Methodist, a very chill church, so chill you could fall asleep. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not like a, like a Baptist where they're like screaming you awake type of thing. We we're very chill. So I grew up um, with that. And then I got this thing, it's called scrupulosity, which is a very, which is like, the easiest way to explain it is uh, religious OCD. So you pray in your head, like over and over and over and over and over. And it doesn't make sense till eventually you like feel better. You know? And I, I just thought that's the way religion worked growing up. So I had that going on, which is crazy. And my parents were like, it'll be okay. And I, and I love them both. And I would have been the same way as I was them because I'm like, this is difficult. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I remember I had a... I had an accident when I was a kid. I uh, cracked the back of my skull. I was uh, third, like maybe 14 years old. It was a basketball game. It was a championship basketball game. I'm sure you guys remember it. It was between the Raptors and uh, the Cougars. You guys were there. And Was it the, the Southwest Cougars? Yeah. yeah I went was, to that school, yeah. Yeah, so did I, bro. <laughs> yeah. And um, <laughs> it was a good game. I broke my skull. I cracked it. And uh, so we didn't win that day. But the um, – <laughs> The star player was down. Right, yeah. <laughs> I was the tallest kid in middle school. Yay. And um, once that happened, I uh, I started everything I'd ever experienced in my life, I could remember it very well. Not perfectly. Huh. I mean, I'm not saying it's like a savant type, like an acquired savant type of shit. 
um, and I started watching scary movies. I don't know if you've ever seen my scary movie bit where you give me any scary movie, I'll yeah, tell you. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, thanks. It's amazing. That you, I, yeah, it's, it's it's not just it's, it's it's a lot it's a lot of different types of movies too, right? Or yeah, I can break scary. it into other genres yeah. or genres as I like to fuck yeah, around it is with people because it's scary loud. movies though. Yeah, but it um. Every, Around that time is when I started binging movies because I was out of school for a month and a half. Oh, wow. And you got to imagine 14 years old. That's that's a dream. Yeah. So I'm wearing that neck thing, and I can't can't move, can't do anything, just watch movies. So I was like, why not, uh, you know, rent every Friday 13th all of the Hellraisers and all this stuff. And for some reason, it just stuck in my head. It's still there. And uh, that's what became of that. Got into drugs, uh, alcohol, love alcohol. Uh I mean, I don't like love it as much as I used to, but there's something about it. I was such an angry teenager, and I think a lot of that had to do with the injury the to head my head. Yeah. yeah, it was right back there in the back of the head, which is close to I think they call it the doula amagata. Yeah, and your amygdala and all that stuff. Yeah, and I was I was an angry motherfucker and um, so mad, and that chilled me out. Alcohol made me so chill. Right. So I, I got on that real good, and then, you know, that was fine, smoking weed, loved weed, and then uh, the, then the real drugs, like, came in, you know. Um, I, I, I've done a lot of tripping. I've tripped a good good amount of times. Research chemicals, uh, we, <laughs> and those were the best because I felt like that was my way of, like, uh, connecting with God was through yeah. tripping because you, you are in a different dimension. Well, psychedelics are sort of a different thing, though. They're sort of uh, almost anti-addictive mm -hmm. yeah yeah i wasn't addicted to tripping uh, per se but the, i think the the vision that i was after like connecting with god life reality you know it turned into trying to uh to chase <clears throat> something oh yeah and it wasn't as good anymore it wasn't as good and it it you go into you start getting panic attacks out of nowhere because you're fucking with your with your brain and you don't even think about it Chantex. I remember taking Chantex. That's not even a drug. I mean, it is a drug, but you're trying to quit it's like, smoking yeah, cigarettes. Yeah, that's a smoking, anti-smoking yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Have you, like, right now... It, it, There's some go ahead. questionable stuff about Chantex. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. I've never had taken a drug before where the next morning I wake up from a dream that is just as real right now, and I'm trying to realize that, that shit's real or not. But it, it, it messed with my fucking psychology, you know, the, wow. my brain and... Yeah. And then there are drugs on top of that. A lot of good ecstasy. Love ecstasy. <laughs> I still, I'll take that now. I'll be honest with you. People at home take ecstasy one time. All right. Not all the time. But now do they're doing uh, a lot of uh, psychotherapy research on MDMA now. It's, it's uh, curing PTSD. Yeah. But they're not doing it at raves. They're doing it in, you know, <laughs> clinical settings. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a good old dosing station. That's all we need here in Greensboro. I'll tell you, they've never killed anybody, so why, they can't be that bad. Is there something, like you were saying, like you started off as kind of like an angry comic and, and that kind of stuff, and I imagine there was something, maybe it was a whole bunch of things where you kind of got away from that. Was there something that just like pivotal where you just like, I'm not doing that anymore, or was it like a gradual kind of change? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, like uh, the panic attacks. Uh, I remember we were, uh, me and my friends were doing this research chemical called uh, 2CE, which is kind of like acid on uh, steroids is super strong uh. so like your face would be like a, like a, like you crack an egg you know like your face is oh, just floating. and it, it was just it was <laughs> a lot and i did it with myself one time around friends who weren't doing it and it was so bad like i started getting these panic attacks and i felt like i, I didn't know what a panic attack was nobody right. had ever told me what that was and it, it was just killing me inside so i went to the doctor got the medicine that i required to help fix that right and I think I spent a lot of time, I went, I went to read the Bible. I went to things, anything that I could think of. Like I said, it goes back to when I was a kid. You know, the scrupulosity, it was hitting me hard. I was right. praying in my head, it'll come, it'll go. It'll come, it'll go. Uh. And like I say, I, I, I don't know how to decipher a book that I didn't write. I don't know how to decipher certain things. Right. Um, but I feel like uh, eventually one of the biggest things that helped me through that time was uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. Yeah. You guys ever seen that? No. I, I saw the... Bro, you got to watch it. I mean, you know, there was a lot of flack against it, so it wasn't really high on my stack, but... The, the, the animated show? 
Not the animated, the the movie. So oh, the oh, M Night Shyamalan's a piece of shit because right. for that movie. <laughs> now I'm not saying his say other good M. Night, M. Night Shyamalan. If you're watching, which I'm sure you are, don't make another damn <laughs> Avatar movie. Okay, it's about as bad as the DBZ live action. But right. no shit, it that that show right. connected me like spiritually. It nice. need because it taught me things that I didn't even know that I needed. Like right. that, like I said, that was during a time I was like 21. I, I was back in the house with my mom. Things weren't working out. I'm going through all these uh, panic attacks. I, I, I just thought it was hell. I right, thought it was yeah. hell. And that show just fed my soul. So if you hadn't seen it, I, I really suggest Avatar The Last Airbender. It is so good, man. Cool. Yeah, I've seen you post a lot of stuff about it. Yeah, yeah. especially right now. Uh, mm-hmm. it, because I'm a lot about it. forgiveness and stuff like that. Yes. Oh, yeah. God. I tell you, man, it's hard to forgive yourself. I think it's easier to forgive somebody else. Like right. if you did something horrible to me, I don't know what it. I don't even want to think of what it is. It'd be easier for me to forgive you, I right. think, than me to be able to forgive myself for things that I remember that, or that I didn't do, or that I didn't do the right way. Yeah, yeah I can relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm. I let things go really easy, but I'm. I'm hard on myself. Yes. Yeah. I forgive other people quickly, but. I don't always forgive myself for things. Yeah. 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 No, I'm, I'm the same way. I think, well, I, I say this to a lot of people, actually, that nobody can beat you like you. And, <laughs> yeah. and like, I hold other people to a high standard, but I try to hold myself to a really high standard, right? Yeah. And you just got to take, like, it's something I have to work on. Like, you know what? It's okay. But, but I agree with you on that. I think I can forgive other people. And, um, you know, a decade ago, it was probably the, the other way around for me, you know, and, um, then it then it became a big push for me to take responsibility for what I did or what I didn't do mm-hmm. instead of blaming other people for my problems. Like, you know what? I'm the guy making the decisions. I need to take responsibility. Like, as a leader, of, you know, you, you said you own a business, and, and uh, you and your partner, as a, as a leader and as a, a business owner, you got to take responsibility for the things other people do. So, yeah. But I think I went too far down that sometimes where, you know, you just got to go, it's going to be okay, you know. We all make mistakes. That's how we learn. That's how we move forward. Didn't you guys have like coping mechanisms for when you, uh, you know, like I've, <clears throat> I've been in situations where, okay, I've had some cameras and stuff mess up and we lost some stuff and I'm feeling terrible. Like, like, you know, not that I was going to kill myself or anything like that, but level that way. And I used like meditation as a quick way to kind of bring myself down. Nothing fancy, just like, okay, get a grip kind of stuff. But do you guys have any like, coping mechanisms like that by chance just curious lots of cursing yeah <laughs> always yeah. i do that as, as, as and, and hopefully not in front of my children my three <laughs> young children um maybe break more stuff yeah <laughs> you know again if we're talking about a decade ago or 15 years ago my method was right. probably yeah uh the wrong way to do it now right. it's um tony robbins says something about re- a two-minute reset so changing your state of mind within two minutes mm-hmm. and i'm not doing it justice but I'll say that sometimes, but one of the things I do say, Warren Buffett says, a man that cannot control his temper cannot control his money, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, when I'm losing my temper, what it really means is I can't make a rational decision because I'm letting anger, this emotion, affect what I'm doing, right? right? So I use that now with my children, with my partners, with my employee, my staff. I use it with my wife, Um, love her to death, but I try to really control my state my current state that I'm in so that I don't let anger be the thing that decides how I handle things. Right. Yep. Yeah. And that's hard to do sometimes. <laughs> so I can find a spot or, or I'm around in a safe, a safe place for me around a good friend, a partner, right. a buddy. <clears throat> and, and, and I don't have to be PC and I right. can, oh, yeah, fucking, you know, whatever yeah. it is, right. That, that, uh, let off of, uh, that blowing off steam. You have to feel yeah, that, man, that, that helps too. a lot. It does. Um, I'd love to tell you that we got a, a gym, we own a we own a private gym, and I'd love to tell you I'm in there lifting weights, and that does it for me. But it doesn't, right. and, and I'm not. Right. Um, it probably would be a good idea. Working I'm out for me helps a too. lot. Yeah. Like, actually, training helps me a lot because just training by myself and <clears throat> just having that time to think makes a big difference. Sure. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've I've calmed down a whole lot too. Yeah. I mean, he, he knew yep. me when I was younger. I was a lot I was a lot more intense. Oh yeah. But I uh, honestly, when I lost my leg. Uh, in a motorcycle accident, that's what really changed me because, um, you know, when you have that 
near death experience and I was totally conscious the whole time. So yeah, I knew like this could be it. Um, and then I was laid up for a couple of months <clears throat> or for several weeks and I thought, well, uh, I had a, a good time to sort of step back and reevaluate my life and my decisions. And I think we've talked about oh, yeah. appreciating the moment. We, we lost a really close friend recently and uh, a yeah. business partner's brother and but not just a business partner, his brother, just a really good friend of ours. And uh, he was great at uh, enjoying the moment, you know, yeah. and uh, it's hard to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but he, uh, he was a good dude. And, uh, you know, that, you know, thinking about people like him and, and just, you know, how, how, you know, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. May not be here, and mm -hmm. and you have to enjoy those moments. Yeah, you know, every moment's uh, fleeting. So, yeah, yeah. They, uh, a lot of people say sometimes you know getting older can be a curse, but it's such a blessing. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, even at our age, yeah. like all of us are genuinely within a realm of longevity compared to elderly. You yeah. know, right? And it, yeah. it, it it is such a thing to be, and the older you get. Uh, you see great people that you admire and that you love uh, go. Yeah. And it, it, it's something that sticks with you. And I, it, I think if you're close enough with that individual, I think some of the, their greater uh, tribute or, or their um, contributions. Yes. Uh, stick with you. Yeah. I, I, think, yep. I think that. I think of my grandma. I think of my grandpa. People like that that I was really, really fucking close to. When they when they left, I feel like I got some of their best attributes, right? Um, that are in me now, and I, like you say, I think it's about enjoying each other's company, man. Yeah. And uh, learning. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. And, and I'll tell you, so, and I probably should. Get, this is going backwards, but we were talking about how we handle things today, and I told mm -hmm. you a decade ago, or fifteen years ago, I didn't do the best. I don't miss eighteen to twenty-five at all, personally because uh, it was volatile for me. And I know you said you had went through some things. I had a really, really, really difficult time controlling my temper. I was, so I believe, extremely intelligent, but highly volatile and um, had a temper and was harder to deal with and abrasive. And I didn't like, like when I look back, 30 was the best thing to happen to me. Like for whatever reason at 30, I felt like I was 18. Like I felt like an adult. Maybe 18 is a bad, bad analogy, but an adult. So 30 was like, okay, I'm an adult. Now it's time to be an adult. And, and for whatever reason about that, about five years ago, it clicked for me. And I was like, man, I do not miss the chaos of my 20s. Yeah, yeah I, me either, man. <laughs> I haven't been arrested in my 30s. I, I was always arrested in my 20s. <laughs> Every damn time I was 20, I got arrested. But I did. Uh, that, that <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. The way I handle things now, like uh, compared... Uh, then to now, I was much more rash. Yeah, I can. I am such an in my head individual. Like I said, I think a lot of that has to do with OCD. Right. Because you are in your head. So if I if I have a set uh, that I remember one thing bad, I'll, I'll click on it like it sticks on my head. Oh it, wow. it will not go away. I almost feel as good as my last set. So if I had a good last set, I feel great. If I had a bad last set, I feel bad. Uh. Oh yeah, it sucks to bomb anyway. It, like it just eats eats at you mm -hmm. for a long time. And it, and it doesn't get easy. Like it, it it never gets better. Where I'm like, <laughs> I bombed. I'm growing. Like that never. I, I, which is true. You <laughs> are. Yeah, in it feels the like moment. You're dying. <laughs> yeah, I feel like God. I just embarrassed the shit out of myself in front of people that I don't really care what the fuck they think about me. And worse, on average. it feels like you failed. Yeah, it feels like it's like I just. I'm, you know, and when it's happening, it's like, oh, like I, I have to get through this, mm -hmm. and I'm just failing and failing and failing, and now I'm just going to go kill myself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> In any other profession, like there's no fireman who's like, man, I had a bad set today. Let's go home. You know, yeah. <laughs> but they keep getting good. They yeah, keep getting better. We didn't get that fire this time, but, you know, we'll get it next time. Yeah. <laughs> well, poor family. Here we yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just fine to go. But, yeah, I don't, I don't care how long you've been doing this. You're never going to have a great set every fucking time. If right. you did, you're special. You know, everybody, yeah. even greats, the greats, you know, the ones we all look up to, have a bad set here and there. 
Those aren't yeah. the ones we see right. on the recordings. They want right. us to see their best shit. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you yeah. said that. I'm glad I, I was going to ask you something about this earlier. So I, I'm not a comedian, and, and uh, actually him experiencing it, him showing me some things. I enjoy comedy, mm -hmm. and him you know, being somebody that's really close to me doing it has made me go, man, I think I'd like to get up on stage and make fun of myself. I think it'd be awesome. Um, but, but other than that appreciation for it, I'm curious. I feel like some of the guys that have made it, is it me? Or all the sets the exact same for years? Like, are they using the same, like, or is it just the, I wonder, so like when I, when I was younger, um, I went to Comedy Zone very early. I think I was probably 15, 16 and started at Comedy Zone. And Chris Wiles, awesome comedian, right? But I went so many times, I felt like he was doing the same material over and over and over and over and over again for years. Is that a thing or am I, because you were saying you create new content, new, new bits all the time, but is that, did I just go too much and I just, I saw basically all their material or do you think that's what's going on? You think they're using the same material and if you get a really good set, you can ride it for years? Is that the way it works? No, I believe you, if you have like a great set, like say you got a great 45, great hour, yeah, there's no reason not to ride that. Gotcha. You know, it, it, it's, um, they worked hard for that. But you look at other comics um, like George Carlin, who came out with so many specials right. in his lifetime that were just different. Yeah. And stuff like that. So he's constantly, he, it depends who you are. Right. I, I think you can, you can have a great setup and you, you can ride the shit out of that for years. Right. Where I think it's personally who you are. There's some bands that have a one, uh, you know, one hit wonders that have a song that's so good that we still listen to it today. True. Um, and that's what they're known for. And yeah. other people are known for the variety of what they go through. Right. Um, you can ride. Uh, I would imagine um, I'll do bits that I wrote uh, four years ago that are are hard to beat because at whatever time I writ, uh, the, the muses were in my favor and it was just such a fun bit that I can still work on and even, you know, still mold it. It's not a completely finished piece of clay. Right. But it's definitely close. Like I, I have it in a certain way that I like it. And then others, uh, you got, if you're more of a topical comedian or a political comedian, you have got to change. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's no way you can still be doing Unless Obama's. it's observational, so it's going to have to change. Yeah. yeah. It Unless it's be. about me, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm good at, I'm not good at comedy yet, but I'm really good at researching. And from what I've seen is um, when comedians actually make it to like the top tier, They'll usually work for a couple of years on their on their set on building an hour set or a forty five minute to an hour set, and once they do it and it it gets produced like on Netflix or Amazon or something like HBO or whatever, then they'll start writing a new set. Yeah. And they'll do they'll usually release a new a new special every right. every two years, so that'll all be new material. And some sometimes I, I've, and. Well, I've read and heard that sometimes they'll go back and find old material that they never yeah. really worked out, worked out. Right. And they'll bring it back. Because uh -huh. um, some things are timeless. You know, some things are very current. Right. Um, when I think you can think of something now that you're not ready for till years later. Yeah. I, I, read, I wrote things uh, when, a long time ago that I wasn't ready to finish till now because I didn't have the wherewithal or where the mind I needed to be to finish it. Didn't know the structure. Yeah. 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 And I, there's the stuff that I wrote back when I started that I can't do now uh, because I, 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 don't, I don't feel that it's beneath me. I just feel like it's not at w the quantity or the quality that I like. Right. Yeah. doesn't mean it's good or bad. You just change taste. It's like right. saying I like cheeseburgers over pizza. Yeah. They're both uh, fucking great. You just choose what you like more. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, I heard that this is a good thing that I learned from Eric. Eric Trendy was within your first year, try to get five minutes. If you can get five minutes, you get five minutes a year, you're, you're doing great. If you get more, you're doing even better. But really work on that first five minutes. Five minutes is, is a guest spot anywhere in the world. You, you can do five minutes. It's a guest spot. If you can do that and it's solid as shit, you work towards ten. And 50 only five minute increments and 
the main thing is trying to create a new five minutes every year. And I know we, we have a really great uh, competition here in Greensboro, the Ultimate Comic Challenge, UCC. And every year I try to have a different five minute set. And over the years I can take that five minutes and I, I, I have some things that I can juggle with and play with. Right. Awesome. Very cool. So what do you have now? What's your uh, your full set now? Like your biggest set? Uh, <laughs> it's a tough question. Um, I guess overall, like I can do. I mean, if I needed to, and I took every everything together, like we're in the sand lot, right? And we take all of the erector sets to build the big thing, you know, to <coughs> go through and trying to get the ball back. Uh, I could do. I, I I might could do an hour. I, I don't want to. I don't want to quote quote myself okay, on cool. that yeah even though i guess i could if i wanted to but if i really put it all together like i said my memory ain't shit my memory ain't a damn thing like, well, your memory's pretty good to doing that doing that horror bit well yeah did. on things that i've seen but if i'm going through things that i've written <laughs> i have to if i had it right there with me perfect but if i had to call it from out you know like we're out in the desert and like take a comedy I, yeah. like if i <laughs> to do every day because that's what they do in the desert um it would be difficult for me, and that just has to do with right. my my memorization, memory. Right. I need I, luminosity. I think the acting experience helps me with that. I bet so, because that you knowing learn. the bits. Yeah, yeah. the trainedness yeah. that you have. Um, yeah. And like I said, like uh, when it comes to comedy, I hate to be constricted and have to do the same. You know, like I said, back in the day, it used to be like OCD, like boop, 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 boop. Yeah. And if one thing goes wrong, it throws you completely into chaos. Which right. What gets me is just, just being, it's so different being on stage and the timing, like making the timing right for the laughs. And then if they don't laugh, <laughs> when, when you think they're supposed to. And, and it's just, it's such a, a Rubik's Cube. You know, it's, it's, it's. You know, sometimes it goes great, right? And sometimes it's just terrifying, you know. Uh, and if it starts going bad, it's hard to, it's hard to like try to build it back up, like. Especially if you feel like that bit is spent. Yeah. And you still have two minutes to go. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like Fuck. if I'm reading a, uh. a like a bedtime story to a kid that's like, this makes me feel awake, and I still have like half the book to go. I'm like <laughs> shit, what the fuck am I supposed to do? You know you. <laughs> You, that's where that improv comes in, and sometimes it goes great, and sometimes it goes bad. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's absolutely horrible. Do you have to finish the time? You don't yeah. have to. You can just. Well, I mean, you don't have to, but I do. Yeah. I always do. I, too, I won't. I, I won't. I will not go if I can help it. Don't don't go long, and don't go too early. But it's okay to go long. It is not okay to go too. Um, sorry, it's okay to go short, but it is not okay to go long. Yeah. Right. If that makes sense. Oh, yeah. You want to piss somebody off. So you're disrespecting other, other people. That's exactly yeah. right. You right. see that light and yeah. you go on for three more minutes and it was supposed to be like a minute light. Yeah. You're an asshole. Like it, yeah. it, it's not, it's not that you're an asshole. It makes you look like an asshole. Right. right. Yeah. And it shows a certain type of. Cause you're taking somebody else's time basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. And if you're already doing bad and you go on two extra minutes doing bad, damn, everything's brought down. Yeah. Bring the room down. Yeah, the audience, I mean, just having that energy and shit like that, when one goes great, everything stays up. Yeah, when it goes yeah. when it stay, goes down, it's hard to get it back up sometimes. That's interesting, too. I've noticed that, you know, some nights the energy is really great. And usually when the energy is really great, your set goes really well. Yeah. And then some nights everybody's just tired and depressed and the energy is really low. And then the sets just don't go very well. Like yep. I, I've seen some nights, even like some of the really good, like you and some of the other really seasoned comics, still struggle to get laughs. Yeah, and I mean, and it's like nobody it. wants to laugh. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I, there was one in particular. I remember we we we, we did at a at a local spot that the whole night was just shit. Everything yeah. was bad. It was just like a dry hand job. Everybody, nobody was having fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking horrible. I hate those. <laughs> yeah, they're they're the absolute worst. <laughs> They'll ruin any movie you're in. And the, <laughs> the <laughs> that was that type of night. Yeah. And I, I saw people that I look up to, and 
you know, versus, you know, somebody new looking up to somebody versus somebody further looking up and stuff like that, it, it, when you see everybody doing bad, it, A, it makes me feel a little bit better. And it well, also yeah. makes me sad as shit because everybody's. It's just hard to gauge your work, though, because it's like. Yeah. Because I know that this joke is has worked before. But now, just people just hate me. No. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, are you not getting feedback? What is that audience? Is that audience uh, professionals? Are they are they fellow comedians? It's usually when it's all comedians, and everybody's think? tired. Well, making a a group a com- like a audience of comedians laugh versus making regular I call them real people laugh are two different things. Real people are easier to make laugh. On average, on well, average, usually, not yeah, always. Though. Yeah, that's true. On average, they are. I think if you, you're at a comedy show. Yeah, if you if you had three hundred people, it's so much easier to make a good percentage of those people laugh. Right. Because if you're only going to get thirty, forty, fifty percent of people laughing, if there's more people, damn, it makes you feel better. Yeah. You know, because yeah, the percentage, yeah. you know, it goes up. Uh, when you have comics, I, I, you know, you hear comics that are comedians, comedian. You right. Know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Barry Crimmins and some people like that are. They're very funny. They're so good. We're so good at what they did. And, but when it comes to regular Joe people, like, hi, my name's Martha, you know, and they're just doing a show, you know, they're coming to watch a show. Sometimes those people are harder to make laugh. You know, clean comedy makes more money. Well, um, I think it depends on your crowd. Like, if there are people that are inter- interested in the topics that you're discussing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it, that's where relation comes in. Like, you yeah. got to relate to people. Right. The hard part is trying to take what you know, make it funny, and then make it relatable to uh, Betty Joe over there. Right. Like, I, I want Betty Joe to laugh at what the fuck I'm talking about. Right. But I, I got to figure out how to throw it out there. Yeah. And then there's some topics that are universal. Like, boy, my children. You know, there, yeah. there's about 75% of people out there like, I got children. Yep. This yeah. will make me laugh. Yeah. Right. And the people that don't have kids, it's hard to get the whole damn yeah. crew together to laugh because yeah. we all hate kids. Let's be honest, guys. Like, there's <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Even our own. We're like, they're all right. But the, the real truth is, like, it, it's hard to relate and try to get the most percentage of people to laugh at one time. Right. right. Yeah. It's really tough in a bar setting, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, <laughs> it's real tough. That's like a social experiment. Those were the hardest things for me when I started doing bar shows. I was just like, God, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. It's like the people were just talking to each other. They don't care. And then, you know, like that one night, though, I had a really good experience. Yeah. Um, for some reason, they just liked the content I was talking about. Where you get, you get yeah. everybody on the same thing to doing the same thing. It's like trying to teach somebody a magic trick. If you keep them entertained enough to see the rest of the trick they'll pay attention attention trying to keep people's attention right and it can be things that you say it's the way you say it you can yell if you want i'm not and i don't particularly like the loudest comics in the world you can be halfway in the middle right right you know i like using physicality and being somewhat near the middle as far as like loudness but yeah you know keeping people's attention is hard and i think and and if you can't do it then nobody can do it because you're great at crowd work and improv. I mean, when I when I when I see you go up before me, and you have trouble, I'm like, I'm fucked. Like, there's no chance. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. I mean, I try, and like I say, I try to write new shit. I think I think trying to continually write new shit is the hardest part because I I could do the same bits that I know will work. Right. And. Yeah, I may get the laughs that make me feel better, but on the drive home, I'll be like, I'm a whore. Yeah. Because I'm not creating more. Yeah. I, 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 never, I never stop wanting to reach that next bit, whatever it is. So, where, so then, where's a safe space for you to work on your new bits, or do you just do them? Do you just, you know, it's open game. Wherever you're performing at that week or that night. You, you just do it there? You just test it out? Or do you have a special place you like to work on new bits? Well, 
Um, the earlier the mics, uh, the, when it, uh, Tuesday, uh, we got Gibbs, 100, uh, 100 Brewing, uh, which is great, ran by Nick Chacha, sweet, wonderful person, very good bass yeah. uh, voice. Great. Cool uh, voice. Yeah. yeah, very. I want him to read books to me. And uh, <laughs> that place is a good place to do some new new material. And then after that, we got Westerwood, uh, which is, the, in my opinion, the hardest mic. Very it, difficult. In town. It can go really well or really terrible. That's exactly right. Yeah. Because on average, people are there to just drink and talk and do what they're doing. Right. Insanely talented musicians there, though. Yes. Uh, we got wonderful. They got wonderful places out there. Maddie Sheets is phenomenal for running that mic. Maddie Sheets is, I think, pretty sure run like a mic for about like 15 years or more. Uh, he's endless. He's a Highlander. He can't die. But he... he that place to me is the most like battle zone. Like I'll throw out shit that I just thought of that day or that moment and just go with it and just play with it. If you get any bites, you can keep working on it. And then you re-listen to what you did on your phone. Yeah. Always record, never go up and do comedy without recording. <clears throat> yeah. I'm At least audio, too. you know, um, yep. video wise, it's up to you. I think a lot of people video every one of their sets. There's no reason to do, 50 fucking sets videoed you doing the same damn thing right you know just need to hear it yeah. Yeah. yeah you just got to hear it and I, I can do that easy We're on the way home any specials <laughs> yeah exactly um but that and then you get to the uh, the idiot box i want to do better material yeah it's a if i can help more it professional atmosphere, well, yeah. that's what it, i'm not going to earn a thing by doing having the best set in the world at westerwood no even though that it's place a, it's, is a, great, it's a rehearsal, it, it is a great place to practice, and yeah. that's what it's set up for. And that that's why when you get to a club that you respect and you want to, you know, you get, you know, real comics coming in and stuff like that, like the Idiot Box, you want to do good there. Right. That's another thing. When I'm when I'm at the Idiot Box, I feel the pressure of I need to do well here. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. There is a yeah. certain type of, like you said, a gravity to it. Yeah. To where you want to do good, and there's other times where if I haven't got up early in the week, I need to do new shit there, and uh, it, it, to each their own type of thing. But I, I just feel the constant ability or the need to to write new and work on old. Do you get much uh, like people coming up as comedians, like people first starting off? Do you get a lot of people asking you for advice or anything like that? And like, what are do you, uh, you probably have like a little spiel you give them, like just a few like do this and this and this, go yeah. away or something like that, you know? Yeah, um, I always love it uh, when a new comic comes. Normally they don't come up to you. Right. Uh, I feel the need to come up to them. Oh, cool. Because I remember, like I said, when I started, it, there was a hierarchy. Yeah. Like middle school. And when I see a new comic, I like to ask them, how long have you done, been doing this? And most of the time I can tell if they're brand new. And they'll say, like, you know, a week or two. <clears throat> and I like to give them some tips, like record every one of your sets. You know, my name's Dusty, blah, blah, blah. You ever want to talk about comedy, something like that, you know, hit me up. I, I try, I'm a very motherly man, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense. I, I really, can tell you're yeah, a nurturer. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I really do feel like I want to bring I love because I remember how you hard. You gave me some good advice straight on and it helped. I mean, I, I made some you know simple modifications to some of my bits and it made it work. Thanks. And I, yeah. I mean, I like to pay attention to a new comic. I feel like I'm still in preschool, but yeah. Yeah, well, I think we all are in the in, all, in the end of all things, you know. But uh, the um, I love to watch a new comic that I haven't seen um, to see what, what what they're bringing to the table, and a to see if they're a new comic. If it's somebody who's been doing it for a while, you know, you just say hey. But if it's a new comic, I know how hard it is, right. and I, I know for real they probably had to go through some shitty shit to want to put themselves through some shitty shit. Like doing stand-up comedy, right? And when when I when I see them doing that, I feel for them because I remember how hard it was for me, and there was nobody to be like, dude, yeah, I understand. Like I said, I kept my mouth shut for six months. Right. All those people that I respected, that I looked up to, a lot of those fuckers aren't even doing this anymore. I miss you, Jay. All right, come back. But most of them, they're gone. They're it's gone like forever. Acting too, mm -hmm. yeah. and everything else business we've seen a lot of people coming go business yeah consistency is key yeah you know everybody everybody thinks they can sacrifice and, and they can for moments and but those moments are fleeting 
I think if you can do something over a long period of time and be consistent with it, you're going to be excellent at it eventually. Should be. Right. We, we were actually talking about that uh, previously. So, yeah, you know, have you hit your 10,000 hours yet? You think? I was just about to throw out 10,000. No, yeah. I hadn't been to 10,000 hours yet. You're uh, probably I, pretty close. I don't. I don't even think I'm even close to close, bro. If we're talking, well, you count your writing time too, though. You're probably. I don't. You're pro- you just. You just. I, count, I count my straight up it. performance. Time. Oh, okay. Well, I think yeah. that's to each. Maybe separate them then. So maybe ten thousand hours on writing. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the way I wrote when I first started, which was long-handed, versus now, which is short-handed, where I can work out a bit on stage, versus setting up uh, pictures of my family on a couch and then performing in front of them. <laughs> That's how I started. I yeah. did that for the longest time. I'd put, I'd put my phone on timer, put up pictures of uh, like my mom, my dad, and my aunt, uh, what do you call them, where your brother has a kid. Nieces, nieces nephews. nephews yeah. yeah, that's what you call them. <laughs> <laughs> Mistakes. Anyway, but then you, uh, you, you know, you. That's how I'd perform, uh, trying to look at faces. Right. And then I realized, like, man, I don't want to fucking have to do this all the time. Yeah. So I write much more shorthanded now, and uh, I go off of audio where I'm driving. My best writing's done when I'm driving. Okay. And I just record a thought that I had. Yeah, and if I have a thought, I'll, I'll record it in my phone, in my notes. Yeah. yeah, and then I'll get home and I'll write it down. Yeah. Uh, technically longhand, but not like I used to. But I'm a writer, though, so I think, I, you know, I, I enjoy writing. So I'll actually yeah. write out mm-hmm. all these bits. And I'll, and I'll write them. I'll just write all my thoughts out and then go back and try to cut them down and sharpen them up. And, and I'm still learning the comedic structure. So, you know, like, so I've got a... Still a lot to learn, but I'm learning it, you know. But I, but I enjoy the writing part. If 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 the stage part was the, as as enjoyable to me as the writing part, I'd be a lot better. <laughs> yeah, I agree. yeah, I'm, I'm the opposite. Like uh, you're right, you are a good writer. I remember you. I asked about your notes, and you showed me your notes. I was like, Jesus! It's like slow the hell down. This is a Harry Potter book right here. I just read half of Game of Thrones. Like you really went through it, yeah. which is phenomenal because that you know there is no right or wrong way. What which way fits for you? I'm more of a visual or yeah. a, um, active learner. Like right. I have to do it, so yeah. I have to fuck up the cake a lot. Before I make a good cake, right? Yeah. Where you're like, I follow the recipe, <laughs> and it works for you. Yeah. You know, there there is no right or wrong way, and that's the, another wonderful way of seeing this. Oh yeah. And some people do it wrong. I remember giving tags to this one dude, and he's like, "Well, I can't use it now because you said it." I was like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" I said, "It's called a tag." It's a gift. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I, I, I'm giving you a tag because I actually listen to your bullshit up there, and I want to help you. Yeah. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with that. No, that, that's great. That is yeah. such a beautiful thing to. It's, it's like a nice roasting. thing to do too. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like anything else. If you can share ideas, yeah, 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 just to be nice to try to help somebody craft their craft is never a wrong thing. Because sometimes when you're so focused on your own thing, you'll miss a lot of possibilities. Mm-hmm. And someone else could be like, "Hey, have you thought about this?" Like, "Oh, no, I didn't think about that. That's right. great." That's yeah. Perfect. Anytime a comic gives me a tag, it feels like they're giving me a hug to my heart. Right. That's how beautiful yeah. it is. Yeah. I think that's uh, it's yeah, con- it's like constructive criticism. Is that because I'm not the tag? Is that what that is? Is it like a is it feedback? Is it t- some type of constructive feedback, or is it like f- what, helping them take the joke from a different angle? A tag or? is like an like an add on to a, a punchline, I guess. Yes, yeah, or like uh, say that I'm like uh, I want to talk about balloons, and you give me a tag. You're like, dude, what about helium? What about you know uh, like a uh, string? It's like what about expanding upon I got you. an idea. It's an add-on or I got thing. plus one. Yes, yeah, or, or two or three. That's yeah. exactly right. So like plus when I gotcha. when I write a bit, when I write a bit, like I write if I have a premise, then I'll write out the premise. Like everything I think, like my feelings about or my thoughts about this premise, and then it, it won't be funny at all. It'll just be just a, a, a my uh, par- like my reporting on this premise, and then. I'll go into it and I'll say, okay, what's what's funny about it? What's ridiculous about it? What's nonsensical about this idea or this premise? And then I'll just, in, in each sentence, I'll, I'll look for places to throw a tag, like something that you can kind of expound upon that would be funny. Right. Like, why is this, this specific part of this funny? And then a really good comedian, they'll have those every 15 seconds. 
yeah. throughout that whole bit. And, and so, but like my bits are long, so I, I'm, a, I'm more of an observational storyteller. So like I might write a five minute bit and then I have to go through and like make funny, like find the funny parts through it. And that's the challenge. That's the, that's the, the, um, the crux. Yeah. Or, or the puzzle that yeah. you have to solve. And that's, that's what he's talking if, You know, he may hear me go through a bit and maybe I go through like a, a part of it that's just too long without it being funny. Right. And you just say, hey, here's a here's a good tag for this, this to fit into this place right here that's not funny to make it funny. Because yeah. it, cause you just get dead space. And I've got, I actually have one bit where I do that on purpose. I have like a about a 20 second spot that's just boring just to show the audience that that's a boring spot, you know, and then I get a little laugh. Well, that's smart. Yeah, so. that's preemptive. Thinking about it like that because some so. some comics go by uh, what's it called LPM uh, last per minute right yeah and which is definitely uh, uh, merited in my opinion or or they they work on uh, uh, what do you call them sub uh, not subway segways subtext yeah su- segways where you Seg- have to oh. you have to one thing begets the other begets the other begets oh, right. yeah. just like it's a uh, oh, yeah, I do scientific method you right. know, I do thing. segues in all my bits they all segue into the next bit really and then I'll do uh, I'll call I do a lot of callbacks oh that drive me nuts <laughs> I tell you I'm, I'm so all, all over the place just like a damn goof like it, it just when, if I had to try to put the two together it has to just work out that way right. if I'm lucky because it is so hard when I see people doing like what you're doing, it's so hard. Like, it's tough to do. Yeah, yeah it's, it's observational like, storytelling. Storytelling's hard. It's one-liners, kind of like writing a song almost. It's the opposite of one-liners. Like both of them are hard. If you do a whole set, uh, it's yeah. one or the other. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, a one-liner I think is easier to write, but to do a whole, a whole set, set of those, like of Mitch, Hed- it, like Mitch Hedberg coherent, stuff. Yeah, it's crazy. of one-liners yeah. is a damn juggle that'd be so hard when people do that <laughs> uh, it, it's so impressive because instead me. of being funny every 15 seconds that's like funny every line yeah everything you say i remember every I, line's a joke and that's just like what well their set list is a whole piece of paper of like 30 it's things insane. Yeah. where <clears throat> i feel like i'm kind of moderate i'm in between the two i'm not too long not too short it's like an eminem rap song there you go <laughs> Just right, <laughs> just right, and it, it's. I have maybe six to seven things to write down. Where if you had long hand, you got three things you need to talk about. If you got long hand, you got twenty. It, it's <laughs> whatever your style uh, works out best. Right. How hard is it to make a living as a comic? I guess I imagine it's different for all different kind of people. I imagine a lot of people have to have like a. A day job or something to survive off of, especially if you're first getting into it. I mean, I imagine it's sort of a broad question, I know, but what, what's your uh, sort of take on that? Well, I'd say it's almost impossible. Uh, to, <laughs> you know, the um, I work a day job. I'm a farmer, a farmer Dusty up here, and it's it's that's where my money comes from, so I can like do the comedy. Right. Uh, comedy's not at a place now where I'm like. Oh, I, sh- I completely paid a bill with comedy, <laughs> like a substantial bill, right? Like something big. I, I can uh, I can afford my uh, transit uh, payments where you go over, you know, the 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 tolls you don't see right. with comedy, but that ain't much, you know. <laughs> hey, I hate to interrupt you, but have you have you do you have a bit about being a farmer named Dusty? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Got a farmer about being Dusty because there ain't no other. There aren't a lot of jobs for Dusties out there. Most of them are farming or uh, driving a truck. And since I've had some DUIs, I can't have CDLs right now. I guess it's not my fault. <laughs> I think you start off, you make free beer, uh, which doesn't pay any bill, unfortunately, I found out. And then you make little money. You make just a little bit of money. Uh, I don't think you make any money till you're really. <sighs> Touring maybe, like, yeah, yeah, and even then, you're. I think you're. A lot of times, your your expenditures are about as much as you make. That's exactly right. Yeah. It's for the experience. Yeah. Like whenever we go out of town and do shows in uh, like GalaxyCon, Indianapolis, I'm sorry, uh, Kentucky, Louisville, um, we're making about even. Sometimes yeah. we make a little bit more. Yep. But if I would have just worked my regular job that weekend, I would have had the same amount of money. Right. Right. But right. I'm obviously. Uh, doing it my, my, my 
my gift I like to put it as your gift. I think you're born with gifts. I'm I'm trying to do my gift that way. Right. Um, yeah. It comes from notoriety and th- certain things. In some weeks, you get like a job. You make more money than you've ever made doing a short amount of time, like a hundred dollars for ten minutes. That's phenomenal, yeah. in my opinion. And but if you could do that all the time, right, you'd be fine. But the problem, the scarcity of having those. Um, those shows are <laughs> yeah. kind of rare. Right. That's what this show's about, really. It's yeah. about, uh, well, we're the creative businessmen. So, you know, we're trying to talk to other entrepreneurs and artists about how they, you know, got into whatever either business or trade or craft that they do and, and how they're succeeding at it and um, what's been successful so far and then how to be, become more successful at it. Yeah. Um, so I, th- I think with, uh, with comedians, artists, actors, writers, you know, it's all about self-promotion and, and networking. You know, eventually you just have to find the right opportunity. And you're a good comedian, so it's going to happen. I mean, I think, I you know, like we've talked about in business, I think one of the biggest keys to being successful is, is just perseverance. It's yeah. just keeping that momentum, just keep pushing forward and ignoring the, the failures or, or the lack of, of growth because... Um, well, you're a farmer, so you plant a lot of seeds. So even in life, we're planting seeds constantly. That's right. And, you know, a lot of those seeds will never grow, but some of those will grow. And, and that's what you wait for is wait, you wait for the harvest. That's right. You know, and I think, I mean, you're going to have that harvest. 100%. You've been going Absolutely. at it for six years. You're, yeah. It's going to happen. You know, you're going to have those, you're going to start getting those bigger shows right. and, and getting your name out there. And people are going to appreciate your comedy because you're funny, dude. Yeah. You're, Thanks, man. You're yeah, really I, funny. I agree with you, man, about the uh, planting seeds, man. I yeah. think that, that that's that's what it's about. And the perseverance, like, uh, you just keep walking. Yeah. You just keep going, and you keep going, and you keep growing. Things will happen. Because yeah. I know one thing for sure, like, we're talking about, you know, six years ago, I was married, I was unhappy. None of this would be happening if I didn't just keep moving. And that's right. the same with anybody else, yeah. with anything else they go through. Just keep walking. It, it, it's called hope, and it's got a little bit of faith. And you got a little faith in yourself and hope in the future. Yeah. Man, you you just keep the fuck walking. Yeah, and right. things will happen. Because 100%. if you don't, they won't. I know yeah. for a fact, if I didn't do a damn thing or anybody didn't do a damn thing, I know the answer is that nothing that I want to achieve will happen. Right, or you You're get right. the coronavirus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you're exactly right. Yeah, and and I think yeah. it was Sam Walton said, every overnight success is 20 years in the making. Right. Right? So yeah. no one is going to see all the sacrifice, all the times you just kept walking, until you're successful. Then they felt like you came out of nowhere, right? But they mm-hmm. just... They didn't see all the work they that went see into the, it. Yeah, the process all, that you yeah. had to go through, right? Because mm-hmm. in the beginning, you know, and I don't know, there's a lot of big names in comedy, but... Um, yeah, I wonder sometimes, you know, I look back and uh, there are people, uh, you know, like, like say Chris Rock, right? And I see some of the very early stuff he did and I'm like, and it, it, it humbles my opinion of him because I just thought, man, he could do it wrong. Or, or, you know, there's a couple of big names, but you're like, man, these guys are just nailing and nailing and nailing. But you look at some of the really early stuff and you're like, you know what? This guy's a human. This guy's a, a guy just like me who had to figure it out, right? Mm-hmm. And he didn't come out and he wasn't, uh, you know... He wasn't at the level he is today 10 years ago or 12 years or 20 years ago. Like, it, it's a process. Everybody has to go through that process. And right. what we're witnessing is, like, we're seeing you right now at the point you are in this process. But you're already, what, seven years in? Six, six, six years yeah. in? Yeah. So what, what happens when, when we take a snapshot and look at you at 10 years in, right? Like, at what point does it click for you, the success part of it, right? The, you're successful at it. What, what point does it click where you're having the big paydays where – you don't have, you're not farmer. I don't know if that's a goal, is it? Oh, I definitely don't want to farm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do it, uh, I, and it's something that kind of feeds my soul in its own way. And I mean, I mean, I wouldn't mind owning one. Yeah, there you go. I like that. But I definitely don't want to have to be out there when I don't want to be. Right. Yeah. Kind yeah. of a thing. Uh, I want to... I wouldn't mind owning some businesses, going through some things. Sort of like Chris Pratt. You know, he has his own farm, but you know he's not out there farming. <laughs> right, yeah. He's Unless not, he wants to go help for the day. Right, yeah. Yeah, I'd be like, PPR work. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. Um, 
Yeah. It, it, it's, it's just a tough place to know where success is. I, I think it, if I stopped now and nothing else happened, I'd be like, man, I feel good about myself. Yeah. You know, I don't feel rich because I'm not right. financially. But as far as uh, spiritually, mentally, uh, I do. You do what you feel passionate yeah. about. Well, it all hit me, man. No shit. Uh, I was at a bonfire. Never done uh, comedy. Not, not in Denton, right? Yes, it was right oh, there was near it? Denton. It was in Farmer. <laughs> is it Farmer, North Carolina? Oh, okay. okay. Close enough. Yeah. yeah. That's basically. Yeah. I was at my friend Jake's house, and uh, we were chilling. And uh, I've always been known as, like, you know, trying to be the funnier person in the group. Trying to. Uh, in Farmer, there's not a lot of funny people. And uh, <laughs> I was there, and somebody's like, you know, I did something really funny. And they said, you know, if you don't use it, if you're not using it, man, you're wasting it. I agree. And that That's shit true. hit me so hard that it, it just woke up my like my third eye or something. Like it just opened my mind to like, holy shit, I if I'm not using what I'm given, I'm wasting it. It doesn't matter if it's your voice and your singing yeah. or your ability to create wood figures or whatever. Uh, sh- shout out to Neil real quick. He did build these. Uh, well, he at least put the pieces together. Damn, Neil, what can't you I do? I bought these and put them together. He bought them and put them together, but he, he designed them, bought them, put them together. Okay, I designed the studio. He designed the studio. I got to take credit for the chairs. I just yes. want to yeah, say, yeah, I'm yeah, comfortable as shit. I, I, uh, I picked these. Are, I'm not leaving. Yeah. I'm staying right here. Just stay as long as you want, dude. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You got to follow your passions, man. But let me ask you, do you think... So for me... When I was younger, money was the goal. Now it's a product of what I do, right? And money's just an exchange of value for me at this point in my life. And so basically I show someone else that I appreciate them by exchanging money with them, exchanging something that took my time, effort, and energy to earn, and I give it to them, whether it be the grocery store, whether it be I go to the comedy shop, you know, wherever we're at, I'm choosing to consciously take money out of my wallet and give it to someone that's like me showing my appreciation. That's the way I start to think about this. But if I didn't have money, I'd do the same thing I'm doing. And if I had all the money in the world, I still think for the most part, I'd be doing the same things I'm doing currently. Because I know I love my wife. I love my kids. I'm not the guy that's going to be at home all the time. I'm not the guy that's going to be home for every dinner. And I'm not, I'm not going to be at every event. And I'm not going to be – I do want to be involved and active in their lives, but I'm just not that guy. I'm not that father. I'm not that husband. I love my kids. When I'm there, I'm engaged. But I enjoy being a business person, right? I enjoy the, this process, right? So do you think even if you had – you know, if you were wildly uh, successful, would you still continue doing what you're doing? Or would you do a Eddie Murphy and take a, a, a long sabbatical, you know? <laughs> I don't think I could ever take a sabbatical. Um <laughs> I didn't know what that meant until you said it that way. <laughs> I was, thought it was always the medicine you didn't want. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I would say, yeah, I would definitely do it. I would have my, I'd have, uh, you know, my hands in other things. Right. I, I'd love to make movies, skits, uh, open businesses that are just pretty much just for myself. There you go. Like, a, like an arcade. Love video games. So oh, I love an go. old arcade that was cheap as shit. Ain't no reason not to go. You know what I mean? I'm not making any damn money, but I had enough money. It doesn't matter. Right. Plus, everybody needs a failing business to help out on taxes. That yeah. ain't going to hurt nobody. We call those trophy businesses. Right. There you go. <laughs> um, Charities. I, yeah, yeah. Charities, yeah. yeah. But I would definitely maybe move <laughs> more. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd probably definitely move more towards uh, video. Uh, okay. You know, like skits, filmed things. Right. Uh, I'd love to make a couple of movies in my lifetime. Nice. And well, I think maybe it'll happen. I'm working on it. Well, you know a studio now, so yeah, yeah. I was going to say I can film every movie I've ever wanted to film in here. We might not shoot it in this room. Yeah, but we'll shoot it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an opinion about any of the, um, you know, when this is slightly a segue, but some of the big actors, you know, that obviously they're doing well financially. But do you have any opinion about? Kind of what acting? I mean, I feel like acting over the last couple of years has really come to the, you know, the, the forefront of everything. It's prevalent and everything. There's a little bit of comedy in almost everything now, mm-hmm. right? And maybe it was always there, and I just didn't notice it. But you know, Kevin Hart, you know, I mean, blew up. Right? You talked about Dwayne Johnson and his movie, you know, Jumanji. But it was a, there's a lot of comedy, and and the previous one and the one they just released. And did I just not see that, or is comedy becoming more prevalent? You know, all the Netflix comedy specials, Netflix is not a joke kind of. Do you think it's more prevalent today? Do you think, 
uh, people are more uh, aware of it? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I would say it's maybe we're just realizing it more than we were. Uh, I think some of the best movies that are serious have some comedy in it. I think a great movie has a good mixture of everything. I agree. You, you take Goodfellas. Goodfellas is a pretty serious movie. Yeah. But there are some funny ass parts in that movie. <laughs> you know, it's like jerk off. You know, like shit like that. Like that's funny. Those are parts that, because we in reality, I think more movies are getting more realistic. In in reality, we live better together with people that we joke with. That's yeah. who our best friends are. Yeah. You joke with your best friend. 100%. I don't even care if your best friend's an asshole. You joke with your best friend. Yeah. You have a certain type of comedy between each other. And movies, and I think films are getting more realistic. You look at the new Joker movie, that's a very realistic film. It's intense, yeah. Yeah. And there are some parts in that film that are kind of funny. Yeah. But not many, but overall, I mean, there are some parts in that movie that's like, you know, life is funny. Yeah. We, yeah. I think... Uh, in all things, and Eric, Eric Trinity taught me this, it is easier to make a person cry. It's easier to mark, make a person mad. It is hardest to make a person laugh. Absolutely, yeah. Because we, we put our guards up. Yeah. But when you really get everybody laughing, it is a moment shared that is universal. You yeah. know? Like yeah. laughing at a funeral. People laugh. At, <laughs> we're not laughing at the dead person. Right. But we're laughing. <laughs> Unless they look funky, but other than that, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're laughing at a certain aspect of something they've done. Yeah. We remember first the best, funniest moments that Appreciate person Appreciating the humor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it lasts longer, yeah, I does. think, than all, all the others. <clears throat> and you wouldn't so. think that that was possible. But, but the laugh in the funeral, you know, we, we went to one recently, and, um, you know, there were moments of laughter. And oh, a yeah. lot of that was, you talked about laughter amongst friends, mm -hmm. but that's what that was. Like, some of that comedy transcended that um that person's life you know like it was interesting he was a funny that. dude he was shout out to luke by the yeah, way big time yeah. big time man yeah. there's there's a lot of things that and you say you talk about people being carried on like and and uh neil's shirt luke was like king of the shirts like just he had some very some things that were just so specific to him that i think a lot of people he touched a lot of people and you didn't you don't really think about that until those moments mm -hmm. yeah. and then and you know we had an entire church a huge church full and there were moments where a lot of i mean 70 80 percent were laughing yeah because a friend was was sharing a memory you know yeah that's right so it's pretty cool but you were going to say something it, oh, yeah. sorry go ahead no you go ahead man go ahead i remember oh it's just it's just a story i had you know a funeral i was there with all my family uh grandfather uh, had passed away and stuff but we we're all there they were like tapping me in the shoulder and like looking away when i'd look over my shoulder and stuff and just laughing and giggling men who were like 20 years older than me you know? <laughs> and it's, it was just you know that kind of that kind of thing yeah um to your question about the industry now though uh from an acting perspective uh it's definitely way better now it's way bigger uh for acting and comedy i mean 10 years ago, we couldn't do this. Yeah. You know, the, it's, you know, everything is going away from the network world, right. which was very limited to streaming, uh, personal creations. You know, you have so much access to any information you want. I mean, there's 8 billion people in the world now. Yeah. And people want to watch what they want to watch. And there's enough people now to have just unlimited amounts of content so i think they're shooting like 150 different tv series in atlanta right now wow and you know just 10 or 15 years ago they'd probably be shooting like 30 different shows or something you know it, is, is this at tyler perry, perry studios i'm sure they're shooting a lot just there yeah. but i mean there's there's so much more opportunity now in acting and and in comedy and and even with comedy i mean you could create a YouTube channel and just do jokes on your YouTube channel, do yeah. sets on there, and people would watch it, you know. And it might, and some comedians have actually blown up from just doing their own YouTube channels. Yeah, to having their own specials. Yeah, they'll yeah. do like three minute sets on their YouTube channel, and now they have millions of followers. Yeah. So it's just it's a different world, you know. And um, if there's a there's I, a a case like that. There's a guy a comedian. He films his little. There's several. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. His name. There's the liberal redneck. I see him a lot. I've seen him, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, there's uh, 
I can't think of their names, but there's a, there's a few yeah. that are really good. And, um, you know, so I think, I think now is the best time in entertainment to, to be in this business in this industry because there's so many opportunities mm -hmm. and, um, and, and also it's, it's free content for people. Yeah. You know, the yeah. stuff's free. It's all, it's all, it's not really free. It's, it's monetized through marketing and advertising. Right. But I like that. I'll watch some ads to get free content. Oh, me too. You yeah, know, it's worth it. it yeah. And I, I think this next decade <laughs> is going to be really incredible with technology, the way things are going to change. Um, and, you know, I think for the most part, it'll be a good change. I've got kids and myself, and I'm going to blame it on my kids, but I have YouTube Red. <laughs> I <just> pay for, <laughs> I pay because I don't have to watch the commercials. Yeah. But, but so in exchange, uh, I'm, I'm uh, creating to the, uh, contributing to the monetization by paying right. for it out of my pocket. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I watch so much YouTube or listen to so much YouTube while I'm driving. I don't, I'm not watching it, but every once in, once in a while, I want a little visual uh, input. Like I, I'll just look over and see whatever it is or whoever it is I'm looking in. And I kind of I want some of that, makes but it personal. yeah, it just makes it personal. I like yeah. it a little better. Um, I like to look over and see Joe Rogan every once in a while. You know, it's just my thing. But um, but I just don't like getting interrupted. Like I feel like sometimes those commercials. I wish they could pick where they go. It's yeah. like I'm waiting for the spot. The anticipation's there. I'm like, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. And then a commercial, you know, about deodorant or something. Right? Yeah, they so, do it on purpose. They got that little yellow mark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I need to be able to move that yellow mark just a little bit. You know, let's find the dead spot, put right. it right there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Maybe we can pick our own yellow marks. Yeah. That's what we need. Show. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> maybe you can pick them and somebody's not doing that appropriately. Right, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, monetization is key. And that's, so for me, that was one of the things I had, you were talking about how do you make money and, and when was the first time, I guess I go backwards real quick, but when was the first time you ever got paid anything, any amount of money to do your comedy? Oh, Jesus. Do you remember? Was that that six months in, a year in, or? Oh, that's hard to remember. In all of, all honesty, I remember just wanting to get a show. Right. And then when I finally got asked to do a show, I said, "Oh my God, I'm halfway there. I'm almost to Hollywood." You know, I just <laughs> like, I thought this is the next step. I had no idea I was so far away. And I, I guess, I guess maybe the first time I had ever made money from comedy was just working at a bar at the at the Idiot Box. Right. So I, I was making money for the drinks, not my comedy, uh, yeah, yeah. per se. I maybe I really can't remember. Now well, to tell you the truth. Yeah, maybe you were up on stage, as Neil says, uh, was it eating shit? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe you were up on stage eating shit and people felt bad for you, and afterwards you were serving drinks, they gave you extra tip. Yeah. <laughs> extra buck, you know. Like, or the opposite. You know, you yeah. get lucky, <laughs> you know, you're nice to them, and you have a good set, great. You're nice to them, you have a bad set, they're like, not gonna tip you. Yeah, he doesn't deserve it. Yeah, he'll waste it on stage. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh, uh, that's good, man. Well, let me ask you this: Do you have any? I know. Obviously, you said you submerge yourself with uh, in this thing that you find that's your passion, right? So you're surrounding yourself with people that are that care about comedy. So, have you had anybody close to you that's um, been, uh, I guess, more successful? Maybe they're they're at a different place or a place that you're trying to get to. Have you had that happen? Like um, entertainment industry? Yeah, yeah. In all honesty, no, mm -hmm. not really. I, I mean, that I can like think of, like a peer that I grew up with. Like, right. I know I went to school with a kid, uh, his name's Corey Hunt, and he does music and he's really good. Actually, I think, does, I've, I think I've followed him or something. Yeah, country sounds, music, yeah, he does country kind of, music yeah. and he is extremely well. Yeah. That's honestly the only other person. I got another guy I went to school with named Caleb Brown. He does uh, comedy. I think he might be. He I think he lived in Texas. I don't know where he is at the moment, but right. he's doing comedy. Uh, he's early in, but I, I think he's doing really good things. Um, but other than that, I mean, there's not a ton of people that I went to school with that are pursuing artisan type of jobs that I that I recall I'm sure there's somebody who's right, really right. famous but they're probably an asshole and that's why I didn't talk to him back then <laughs> you know um, but well, I'm that Corey Hunt that's yeah what about in the last six years like some of the people you've worked with um, you know do you guys do you guys get together and talk about these types of things as far as like monetization or is it really just more about the craft and the experience and the opportunity to, to get a set I mean 
You know, because I'd, I'd say that. You'd yeah, say that's so. That's normally so. Like, I mean, any new developments a, a comic has, you know, they'll, you know, we'll bring it up and say, "Oh, that's great! Congratulations! Let's do the show." And then whoever has, whoever does the best, right? You know, you feel you feel fine, you know. And there's always people that'll be above you, and you're always looking up about, you know, you're always looking up to them and stuff like that, and yeah. seeing what they're doing. And I, I've seen great comics that are far and above my my capability that either stopped or right. just didn't keep going and they some of the best comics i've ever met don't do it anymore really yeah well i would tell you if you can't look up to somebody and you think you're at the top you probably need to change who you're hanging around yeah because you always gotta have somebody to chase that's there's right a, i used when when i was younger my father would say oh there's somebody always somebody bigger better you know that whole you think you're a badass there's always somebody stronger there's always mm -hmm. somebody better right I think that that works in business. I think if you think you're at the top, you need to surround yourself with different competition. Yeah. Or be very careful because if you are number one, everybody's trying to get to where you're at, right? That's right. Yeah. I think it's good to have someone on your level. Yeah. You know, someone like a wingman. Yeah, iron sharpens iron. And then, and then iron have man. someone that you have like a mentor, you know, so yeah. they can kind of guide you. Yeah. Um, back to the, uh, well, on, on that topic with, with comedians and comic and stuff, comedy. Um, with acting, the world has gotten really small. So, like, <clears throat> with acting, all, most of your auditions are all taped now. So you don't have to be in L.A. I mean, most of the content is actually taped in, in Georgia now. Um, so most of your auditions are actually for, they'll be L.A. productions, but they're shot in Georgia. Huh. Um, and some even in North Carolina. Uh, but but the, the world has gotten so small because it's all digital. So now you don't have to move to these big markets to get these jobs. You can actually get them here just with a good agent. Um, and comedy, I think, is probably similar, but the only, th the only difference with comedy is that your rehearsal, all of the work is done at the open mics where you're trying to work out your material. And unfortunately, in this market, it's so small, there's not a lot of opportunity to do that. Now, we have a few open mics here, but we don't have the big audiences. And that's the only, that's the only thing I see that, that um, is maybe a, a holdback here is we have open mics, but we don't have good live audiences. Like right. in the bigger cities, you have open mics, but you have actual uh, customers there, audience members at the open mics. So you can get a, I think you get a better sense of, of your material. Because like you said, comics are a tough audience. And it's hard to gauge your material through your audience if it's all comics because, I mean, for one thing, if it's the same people who've heard your material before, so it's hard to laugh at something you've already heard. And then um, also it's not, it's not as diverse a crowd. When you have, like, a yeah. diverse crowd, you have – I feel like you have a better response because I have a lot better – my responses are a lot better when I have a, um, a random live audience with my material than when right. I just have a, a comedy audience. Um, and maybe I just need to go out to Raleigh and down to Charlotte too, um, in, in addition to Greensboro. But uh, what do you think about that? Um, well, I'd say you're probably right. Like it seems like open mics in Greensboro are mostly just comics at the open mics. Um, although at the Idiot Box, sometimes on Friday night, the open mic, you have a lot of regular uh, yeah, leftover from the which show. Is great. Yeah. yeah, from the eight thirty show. There's always like real, real. I, I call them real people uh, for the shows. Right. Uh, for the mics, uh, you'll have a mixture, mainly comics. I wish we had more real people in the open mics. Yeah. Because I think you would have a better gauge of how your material how is. How you're doing, which which is difficult. Um, I think take if you know that everybody in the in the audience are stand up comedians, take whatever you get with a certain grain of salt. I mean, obviously feel good. Uh, it does make you feel good to make your peers laugh. Yeah. You know, it's it's like Michelangelo and Donatello looking at your painting back in the day and be like, that's pretty damn good. <laughs> Morpheus, whatever yeah. your damn name is, it looks great. That makes you feel good. But that's not who's giving us money, like who, who are paying to see us. So I think it's a good mixture of both, uh, yeah. trying to type of a thing. Like I said, a clean show. Um, for a bunch of comics, may not work so great. Right. Um, for real people. Right. I, I think 
they eat uh, some of them eat that shit up. My uh, stuff's not real clean anyway, so mine ain't either. And yeah. I, I've done clean shows, but I'm not happy while yeah. I'm doing them. I just don't really enjoy it. No, yeah. I don't. I don't. I either. like the shock factor of the. Yeah, whatever you call that, and what we do. Yeah, yeah. the twist. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, I like a good twist and being able to throw that to people. And I want to be able to look at an old person and say "fuck" and they don't die. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's a <laughs> kind of thing. I, I talk to. I want to talk to an audience like I talk to regular people. Right. But I also got to know yeah. what makes more money. Uh, Charlotte does a lot of clean shows, and there's good money at those shows. Right. But I have to be clean. Or they say PG-13. Oh, yeah. But they don't mean PG-13. They mean PG. You know, And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not my type of thing. I'm not Sinbad. I'm not yeah. somebody else who, who I respect very highly, but I don't. I don't care to do that. Yeah, Goonies and Walking Dead are both PG-13, but yeah, they're a lot different. Yeah, they're completely different. <laughs> well, that's before they really figured out what PG-13 <laughs> right. was. <laughs> was it Indiana Jones was the first PG-13 oh, yeah. one of them? Was it? Yeah, yeah. I think wow, it was. Okay. Spielberg brought it in. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And it's completely changed throughout the years. That's what... a trashy show, let me tell you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh I didn't know Indiana Jones was PG-13. I'm pretty sure it is, man. That's like rated G. <laughs> it should be. So back to this. If we start a, a comedy shop anywhere near here, we're going to have to call it the Comic Dimension. Since you said that, it oh. didn't <laughs> dawn on me that the Comic Dimension, that you hosted a, a comedy special at the Comic Dimension. And in my mind, it was just the comic shop. But to other people, like you said earlier, they could think that that's an actual comedy spot. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah the name alone. Yeah. <clears throat> definitely uh, throws it in both ways. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to start doing comedy shows there. I just, the main thing is we don't compete with Idiot Box because, right. you know, they're they're awesome and I don't want to do anything that would can, that would affect their business. Right. Yeah. Anything that we do needs to enhance their business and enhance yeah. the comedy scene in the, mm-hmm. in the city. Yeah. Yeah, I love but. to tell any of any, but like anytime I have interviews, like here, and if, even if it's a show, this you know, a podcast or something that isn't here, I always love to you know make sure that people know like how good of a scene we have here in Greensboro. Greensboro has a phenomenal scene. I am so proud of the comics and people we get to work with on a daily basis. Yeah, uh, or did, uh, but <laughs> or will work with on a daily basis right. when things are better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because yeah. right now it, it, it is a trying ass time. It's tough. Uh, I, the thing I hate the most, Neil, is when I see comics. Uh, well, I call them comics. I call them groundhoggers. Uh, they come out once or twice a year <laughs> when it comes around time for a you know competition. Like, man, I wish I could get up. It's like, motherfucker, you weren't up anyway. Like, don't yeah. act like you were going to get up this week. Right. Yeah. Competition ain't nowhere near. They'll come out for a couple of weeks before they inevitably lose the competition because you know why? You don't, they don't fucking work. No, they don't need to work. Yeah. Yeah, and then they get upset and they don't do it, and then it happens again the next time. Yeah. Like, get out of my face with that shit. Like, oh, when you God. do this so much, like so much money lost towards a goal that you love. Yep. Even if I don't make a pos- like a positive like dollar amount on comedy, I, I am so fulfilled in my in my heart. Yeah. You're with, still investing. Yeah. yeah. Still and I mean, investing. I want to be successful. But I think if I'm not happy after what I'm successful about, it, that that's the main thing. Right. If I'm not, yeah. Now, um, I noticed some comedians, they'll have like swag or CDs or, you know, uh, little bags of Coke or whatever that they sell after oh, the yeah, show. Oh, yeah, good old know? merch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good old Coke merch bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah the Coke merch Those bag. Those are the good comics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so, temporarily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're excited. They're jacked. They're jacked, man. They're excited. But uh, but have you have you uh, seen any success with that? I mean, is that an extra thing? Have you considered doing that too as well? Or do you think that's – is that down the sellout line? Or do you think that's something you might Oh, consider? that's – yeah, that's brilliant uh, to sell merch. Uh, so good. Especially if you're mm-hmm. – if you're able to sell like your own like specials or CDs that you've collected, uh, right. good comic. Uh, he's he's around uh, Raleigh, uh, Brent Blakeney, hilarious. If you guys haven't met him, you'll you'll fucking enjoy him. You'll love him. You know he he was able to edit and make his own like d- you know CDs, DVDs that he can sell oh, cool. and stuff like that, which is brilliant. Um, with uh, me and my group, uh, Attention Horse, we've had stickers, we've had buttons. 
if you want to make more money on a lower thing like uh, stickers or buttons, which are really affordable, yeah, donations. Ask for donations instead of asking for a certain dollar price. 100%. I've always noticed you get double, maybe triple what somebody would pay yep. if you just say, hey, just a donation. You guys have those notebooks that are really cool too, though. Yeah, and which are uh, Eric Trundy makes them, and we. Uh, he is so good at that. Uh, I should have had you bring some so we yeah, could show I, I should have. I should have brought yeah. a couple. But there are VHS covers that we, we've he's made into uh, um, notebooks. And they're laminated. And he even takes, like, the top of a VHS and makes it into, like, a, what do you call it, a bookmark? Yeah, that's what you call it. And, ah. uh, they're so neat. Uh, yeah, they're really only, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm a very retro electronic collector. So anything... Above PS3, I don't own. I love retro stuff too, like from the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah really same cool here, stuff. man. Especially VHS. Yeah. That's where the the box art was at its best. Well, that's why I like the Midnight. Yeah. yeah, it's retro. Exactly. Beautiful yeah. music, man. But yeah, I love all that old shit, and those sell really well. Yeah, uh, they do so good because they're such a good product. I remember uh, Christopher Sabat, who's the voice of Vegeta and Piccolo. Uh, on Dragon Ball Z, one of my favorite, <laughs> biggest fandoms of all time. I'm such a, like a fangirl for that shit. <laughs> he came by our booth, and uh, I brought, I gave him uh, the usual suspects, um, you know, uh, thing. I was like, dude, uh, I know you're busy. I know this is the last day. I just want to tell you, I love you. Thank you. This dude has a box, right? He's like, well, here, take this, and it, it's a pop like one of those Funko Pop yeah, yeah, yeah. things signed by him worth like $200. Oh, wow. it, awesome. Mine was worth like $10 top. So I was like, yes, this works. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for my hero to be that yeah. cool, you know, and he talked just like Vegeta's like, yeah, I really appreciate it, bro. Here you go. Yeah, over 9000 He could sign yours and make it work more valuable. Though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but such a cool, that's why I like going to these things. And we, like we're talking about merch, you get a booth if you're lucky when you go to these things and there's, Hundreds of booths, maybe thousands of booths. Right. And just to walk around, they call it the artist alley and stuff like that, to go around these things and to see all the beautiful things that these people have created and t shirts you can't find anywhere except for online if you're smart and, and all kinds of places that are, they're expensive, but damn, it's fucking awesome. Yeah. You ever ate like a $12 pack of Pockies? Like they're delicious. You ever had a Pocky? Maybe. Uh, it's the stick. Japanese yeah, the candy. St- yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've had one of those. Yeah, yeah those are... Oh, God. Yeah. Those are so good. Yeah, Buy well. your own liquor before you go, though. Because <laughs> it is like $9 for Bacardi. It's like one shot. Get out of here. Oh, wow. I'll drink mouthwash before I have to drink that. That's it does the same thing. Just a little different. <laughs> <laughs> and you have fresh breath. Never yeah, that's that. right. Every time you always got fresh breath. <laughs> No, I always wonder because when I've uh, when I've been, there have been times where I had a comedian that did an awesome job, and they didn't have any merchandise, they didn't have any, they didn't have any, and I wanted to, you know, like you go, you pay for an experience. Let's say it's twenty dollars a head to get in, whatever it is, right? And then while you're there, you're buying food, you're buying drinks and snacks and whatever, right? So that all benefits the establishment, you know, the place hosting it, which is great. That's that's necessary. Um, but then you wonder to the comic, like. Hey man, I wish I wish you had something. I wish you had swag. I wish you had something I could show, because you almost just want to give them money, but but I can't do that. Right. But I can exchange of something of value, right? So if they've got something, I'll buy thirty, forty, fifty bucks worth of it just to one. I'm helping them out. I, it's like me saying, hey, I appreciate you. I appreciate your craft and what. Yeah. I appreciate the experience you contributed to tonight for me or for me and my wife. Um, so I mean, I think that's good that you guys do that. That's definitely a um, a way for people to show more appreciation. Yeah, we need more people like you at shows. Because uh, <laughs> an extra $50, damn, all right, you're doing pretty good. But you're right. I, I think that's the second part or maybe even the third part of comedy. You got, like, the initial, like, getting up, doing your material. Then you got the electronic part of this where it's, you know, your social media uh, presence. Right. Which is the hardest part because it's – the least liked. Uh, it depends who you are. I, I'm a. I'm at a certain age. I don't really like that shit. Right. Even though I, I, I try to contribute not as much as I should. Yeah. But I definitely that's something I need to work on. Support it. Yeah. Yeah. Promote yourself. Yeah. Well, and now where everybody's at home. Yeah. All we really have is our social media presence. Right. Yeah. Because my physical presence is not possible. Right. Right yeah, now. That's right. Yeah. 
So I think that this, we're going to see a lot of good come out of this, uh, this whole situation that we're going through. Yeah. Um, with certain comics getting a, a foot, a footing that they never would have gotten before. Yeah. And that includes videos, posts, whatever. Well, and I, and I don't want to pick, and I'm not going to say the name because I don't want to pick on any one show, but a lot of shows got temporarily, I don't know if it canceled is the, right, is the right word, but they're not producing right now, right? A lot of late night shows, maybe all of them. Um, but what's interesting is some of those uh, did some shows from home, like from their phone, right? They really? did some, some version, like some type of entertainment, right? And I'm not, I'm not trying to dog them, but you can tell they're not used to doing that. And it really shows you how well some of these YouTubers, some of these people, some of these Instagram people that are no, that are, they're no names, but they produce this amazing content with no budget, with no, with no director and nobody telling them what to do. Like they don't have the big machine making them work. They don't have everything that makes a late night show successful. Right. And so I saw that and I, I was watching this and I was like, man, I mean, like, I still love this guy. I love listening to him. He's, he's a funny guy, but the quality just wasn't there. And it made me it really made me like you're saying, hey, this could be a big opportunity for people because a lot of people are going to be on their phones or on their computers and stuff, their technology. They can't do anything else. And it may open the doors for some people that other people weren't paying attention to. Well, it's a different format, too. Yeah. I've been on a few TV shows and, and stuff. And and when you're on those series, <clears throat> even being one of the – just a guest star, one of the smaller people at the bottom of the totem pole – you're still treated really well. It's like everything's done for you. And I'm sure those guys, those super celebrities, they you know, they don't do anything. They you know, they, they have a script they have to stick to and everything else is done for them. So when they're doing it themselves, you know, self-producing, you know, we're doing all this. Yeah. So it's a different different world. Yeah, when you have a group of writers helping you on current events, and everything like that, so you're not bombarded with having to do that all the time. Right. When you have to do that instantly, uh, compared to people that have to do that on the average, th there is a, it's big, a big difference. Yeah, there is a, such a big, obvious difference in quality of availability. And I mean, learning how to push the pause button. Yeah, you yeah. know, if you're yeah. filming, you push a pause so you can get your shit together, right? And then go back. I mean, yeah. stuff like that's a big deal. Uh, I'm going to have to figure out. I've got some content I'm going to work on coming out within the next week or so. Uh, having my stepdaughter at the house, I'm a little less hesitant to be just straight up like how I am on stage. Like I don't, I don't lie to my stepkid with who I am. I mean, I'll tell her how I feel, right? You know, and stuff like that. And she's she is phenomenal. Uh, Phoebe is the shit. She's good people. Love you, Phoebe. But. She's not going to watch this, but she, she's, <laughs> she's a great kid. But I'm yeah. not going to be like straight up like, you know what, the fucking deal with female orgasms, what? You know, I'm not <laughs> yeah. going to be like that. <laughs> like, teach me that. You know, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. want to say yeah. that in front of her because no, I'm no. a decent damn person. Um, so I'm kind of <laughs> holding off on that. But your comedy is, is, is your comedy is directed towards adults. Right. Yeah. 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 I normally comedy. talk yeah. to adults. Yeah. You know, yeah. like I said, I like to be a very uh, seem like a adults who can handle your comedy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I comedy try to crowds. Read, yeah. yeah. If you I try to read a crowd. Yeah, if you can't uh, take a joke, don't go to a comedy club. Precisely. I, yeah. I'm a big fan of that. And <laughs> also, <laughs> right. and I also believe in our ability to try to read the crowd and adjust. I, I think that takes time. Like I can't expect somebody who's been doing this earlier on to be able to switch. Right. I've I, I've had a bit. Uh, that's kind of negative towards the KKK because I'm a decent person. And it, uh, you know, it doesn't work out. You know, it, it's that kind of bit. And yeah. I did a show recently where I was like, I read, I looked at the crowd around me. I was like, you know, I'm going to half this in the middle and move on. Were they all KKK members? <laughs> I'm not saying they were, but I'm not saying they weren't. Yeah. Okay, I'm not saying I didn't find a little card in the bathroom trying to, you know, talk yeah. about the white Israelites. You know, that's just me. Yeah. What can I say? I'm a member now. But anyway, they, <laughs> they were very convincing. I was like, you guys got cards. This you is just didn't want to get shot. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. exactly right. Three or four of them had like the 10-gallon hats on. I was like, I don't know what's under that hat. I don't want to fuck with these people. <laughs> and I don't want to make anybody feel bad. Obviously, I want to make any racist feel like a piece of shit. Right. But yeah. considering that I'm not doing that, it wasn't my personal show, and I was doing this show for another club. You and know? you want to come home to your family. Yeah. I want to come <laughs> home to – the last thing I want to do is die over a joke. 
Yeah. Right, Even yeah. though I would if it really came down to it. Yeah. Yeah, I really would. Yeah. I, I have died three times for less. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Turns out when you do some crazy drugs, sometimes you just happen to die. <laughs> <laughs> Weird experience, by the way. Uh. <laughs> do not do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Don't try it. <laughs> yeah. I think the last time will be the last. <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah, we'll see. There, yeah. <laughs> uh, what happened? So, but did you die? I did actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah been there. Yeah, I was flatliners made after me. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I was the key for something. <laughs> kept seeing that kid. I threw rocks, fell out a tree. Can't help it. You know. <laughs> uh, Man, so you said you're going to produce some things. So, um, do you have that stuff memorized? Where can people, like, if they want to check out your stuff, your content, or maybe your Instagram, do you have any of those things memorized where you can tell them, or you want to look them up real quick? Uh, well, uh, one thing I want to do, uh, I love little instruments. I've always been kind of a musical person, but not fully, you know? So, I don't have like a grand piano in my house. I have a Tiny Tykes piano, oh, uh, yeah. which is one of the ones where the colors <laughs> yeah, and stuff yeah. you can follow. And I've been able to learn how to play songs like uh, Chariots of Fire um, and uh, Over the Rainbow and yeah. stuff like that. And I think that stuff's really goofy. You know, I've got one, I've gotten a little accordion that looks like it's meant for like Warwick Davis. It's very little type of a thing. And um, we'll do some musical stuff. And then I, I want to go over things that are positive because we're, it's just easy to give in to sadness right oh, now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. yeah. And my mind goes there too. And if I didn't have, if I wasn't living with my girl, I'm sorry, if my girlfriend was, if we weren't cohabitating together, <laughs> it's our house. First it was mine. But anyway, <laughs> we, you know, we, if I didn't live with her, I would be in much more of a d depressed mood because I have right. nobody to talk to. Um, but now I do, you know, because she lives with me. Um, so I just want to be more positive. Like I say, I, I want to be America's grandma by the time I make it. I want people to be like, oh, that's America's grandma, Dusty. <laughs> right there. That's Former like, farmer. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I'm going to write a book one day called The Farmer's Diary, which is just about weird shit I've experienced while farming. Have I started writing it? Kind of. You're just planning love and humanity. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's how I feel. Yeah. I, I, I do believe, I just want to, my goal, it were you know there's something we're talking about being businessmen trying to create things right yeah. my my final goal if i want to be remembered as somebody who brought love and warmth it's good that's what i believe and yeah, i think great. it really matters how you're remembered it, it didn't matter to me till i was older right uh, how important it was how you were remembered yeah yeah we had a, a bit of a piece about legacy our first podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. and about fear it's and important. how it stops people yeah. from doing things yeah i mean that fear is the death of creativity yeah it, it is yeah and nobody wants to fail absolutely nobody wants to fail but since i like we've talked about earlier I've, i have made some serious fuck-ups in my life and realizing that i survived those fails and that i'm not even close to failing like that anymore right any failure i have is it on on stage is not going to kill me yeah. Even though it feels like it is. Yeah. It yeah. Just makes you stronger. Yeah, it makes you way yeah. stronger. And you got stories. If I would have started when I was 18 years old, like I wish I could go back and do, I would have nowhere near the amount of stories and experiences and oh, shit yeah. that I've lived through. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. You know, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm able to handle situations now. I'm, I'm glad I got it out of my system at 18, 19, 25. Like I'm, I've met people that I felt like didn't. And now they're doing it. They're in yep. their 30s yeah. or 40s, and they're doing it, or, or some 50s and 60s. Like they're, they're trying to experience life now, and I'm like, man. A lot of times their life's already ruined by yeah. that point. So yeah, yeah. yeah. It's only getting worse. I, I would rather make mistakes yeah, I early so I can Jeez. up. And you can't really tell that big of a difference other than the fact that I look like I'm possibly 65. Like that's <laughs> that's okay. That's what happens when you do meth on in 2009. You know, that's the way life works. Instant. Boom. Hair falls out 65 looking your old motherfucker. There's people out there. Uh, they're ethnically ambiguous you're age ambiguous yes yeah. yeah yeah and that's the way i want it I want <laughs> yeah i just want to look like a genie you know that's that's all i want in there life oh but so do you know your instagram handle off the top of your head yeah 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 um now i haven't been able to post on recently i got a new phone 
and I have got to figure out my old password because I don't know. But it's uh, you can type in Dusty Cagle, it'll pop up, C A G L E, or you look up Last Known Gin, which is my, my name on there. And then we also got uh, We Are Attention Horse, which is the Attention Horse. Um, and the same goes for uh, Facebook. Same thing. Dusty Cagle, look me up on there. Yep, and yep. then uh, We Are Attention Horse. Now, are you saying horse or whores? Horse. Horse, like nay. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. We were in Kentucky, <laughs> and a uh, good friend of mine, uh, uh, Jake Wadle, if you haven't met him, great guy out in Greenville, good dude, uh, phenomenal. One of my favorite people I've ever worked with, and he... Uh, there was a horse that was really loud because you know it's Kentucky. I didn't know that Kentucky is just a, just a breeding place Hell for yeah. horses. Yeah. And, Kentucky uh, Derby. I'll, yeah, and this horse wouldn't shut the fuck up. He's like, <laughs> "Man, we're an attention horse." I was like, "Bam, there it is." I love this. I love that name, and we we went with it, and we've ran with it for nice. two three years now. Um, we used to be called Super Nerd Tendo, which I felt like was a phenomenal name. That's good too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, we worked with another guy, and he didn't like it. He's like, ah, we got to change it eventually. Attention like, horse is better. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I like it. Damn. Okay. It probably hits a broader market. Yeah. Yeah, it's, out, it's a good pun. Yeah. It's a good pun. And, uh, you know, the group is uh, me, uh, Reed Pegram. I've talked about him. And then yeah. Pat McLeod. You've met Pat. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Reed. So, yeah. And Pat, uh, I remember seeing him at the UCC finals, the Ultimate Comic Challenge finals. The first year I was in comedy – uh, at the time, I think I was with the hooker, and I had some uh, some uh, peach schnapps with me. Life was not good. <laughs> I'll say that much. And I saw him up there. I was like, God, I, can't, I, I would love to work with this guy one day. And now he's my business partner. Awesome. Because that's, cool. that's how, you know, a lot of things in life aren't like that. But comedy, yeah. it's possible. I oh, think. yeah. You know, the, you meet people. Yeah. Like the fact we met each other so long ago, and then you come here, and it – it's such a neat thing to just feel like there was a type of camaraderie that we didn't weren't able to have back then, right? Because we didn't know each other that well, but yeah. th that we're able to have now. Yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. Beautiful. It's cool. That is. It's very cool. It's awesome, man. It's been, it's been a pleasure meeting you, man. It was an awesome yeah. experience for me because today's the first day I've met you. So, right. I, I told him I was like, man, I don't want to talk to him at almost at all. Until we get started, because because I want I want to discover it on the mic. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I was going to ask you about you, and I, I was like, ah, I was like, you know what? We're going to do this organically. We're yeah. going to yeah. like the first day of uh, <laughs> kindergarten. We're going to do it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I knew then, Daniel would like you. You're a cool guy. Oh yeah, man, you're yeah. cool, man. And I'm I'm. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, man, I'm I'm fascinated by all things. I like the business of all things, right? And to me, you're still you're. You're a person, right? And I like that. And I like that. I can appreciate that. I can hang out with you. But in my mind, too, I'm sitting here. I'm like, the whole time we're talking, I'm sitting here looking at you like a business. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I think we can do this. I think he can do this. I think he can do this. You know, oh, we should do this. Oh, he, he likes this. Let's, let's do that. So, I mean, I'm the whole time, you know, because this is what you're passionate about. And Neil and I have, have done really well um, finding people that are really passionate about things and helping them you know, explore that passion. And, and obviously we have the business side of it. Uh, we've also took a bath sometimes doing that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, good long baths. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but no, it's been an awesome experience uh, meeting you and hearing your perspective and your background and um, that you survived Denton, that bonfire. Yeah. 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 Still yeah. there, unfortunately. One day I'm going <laughs> to fix it. I've survived some uh, small town bonfires yeah. too. So. Yeah. <laughs> the fun ones. <laughs> so, dodge, dodge some beer bottles. Uh, you might have been at the one I, the one that comes to mind real quick. One of them threw a thing of beans, baked beans in the fire, right? Now, eventually, they'll explode. Now, it, I don't remember how old I was, 15, 17, I don't remember. I definitely wasn't underage drinking. Um, <laughs> but a lot of, of my peers in the same age range, and anyway... Like two hours went by. Maybe it was 20 minutes, but those beans eventually exploded. Everybody forgot about them. There was a guy that was standing near the fire when they exploded and just hot beans all over him. He was not happy. <laughs> not happy at all. And, uh, <laughs> I have never heard of that. All right, so, That's a first. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, this guy proceeds to try to find everybody to threaten them. And, Asked who put the beans in the fire, and this went on for about an hour. Like that was my that was this was the Denton bonfire, and and ended up ending with another guy being like, 
He said, hey, did you put the beans in the fire? He's like, yeah, man, are they done? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and literally, as soon as he said that, got punched in the face. And that was how my, le- my Denton bonfire ended. So <laughs> that was, I was like, no. Uh, that was one of the good ones. Yeah, right? man. <laughs> you had beans. You had a fight. Yeah, yeah man. Uh, so, that's good. Yeah, but, uh, but anyway. <laughs> well, dude, it was a pleasure having you all, man. Really enjoyed it. Well, guys, I had a great time. I mean, definitely. Considering uh, the, we 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 won't be getting up doing stand up for a while, this is the yeah. this is the best outlet I could possibly have. I've been going a little stir crazy. Oh yeah, yeah it sure really means going. a lot. You know, definitely man. talking with like minded people that are you know like you said you know after goals and doing things. Yeah, yeah. You know? We'll definitely have you back on too. Yeah, man. Sure. Keep up the good fight, dude. Well, I might yeah. be here when you ask me. Oh, no. <laughs> you know I will. I'll be here. Yeah. yeah. So. Awesome. Okay, well, bye, everybody. Goodbye. Later, Love guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.